So now uh, we are going into the second session uh, for um, our second day of uh, symposium. Yeah. So this uh, uh, session, uh, the theme is called as palm oil processing and derivatives. Uh, so we're going to have uh, three keynote speakers and um, <clears throat> two invited speakers and uh, one speaker. Yeah. So the first speaker will be Dr. Pua Eng Tong from uh, University uh, Technology of Brunei. So the uh, title of the presentation will be Melting and Crystallization Behavior of Soybean Oil in Blend with Palm Oil Based Diacylglycerol. Yeah, so a little bit of uh, by, uh, background of Dr. Pua Eng Tong. So he has earned his bachelor's degree uh, in food technology from uh, University of Science Malaysia and later joined for his PhD from um, University of Putra Malaysia. So his majoring area is in fats and oil processing and he's currently a lecturer in uh, University of Technology Brunei and uh, actively engaged in the research activities uh, focusing on functional food and process uh, simulation. So he also offers professional services to food industry, particularly in uh, edible oil processing uh, technology and food product development. So I'll pass it to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ng Tong Hua. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Pushpa. Yeah. So yeah, a very good afternoon to uh, all of you. And also, thanks for the brief introduction about myself. And also, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present on my research project as well. So basically, uh, the project that I'm going to present today uh, is on the melting and also the crystallization behavior of soybean oil in blend with the palm oil based uh, So let, let us have a brief introduction about the current project first. When we are talking about soybean oil, right, we all know that the soybean oil basically is high in unsaturated fatty acid, uh, especially in the oleic acid, uh, linolenic, acid, linolenic acid, and also the linolenic, linolenic acid. So soybean oil is considered as one of the widely consumed vegetable oils, but this soybean oil is considered to be a soft oil. So it has limited applications, like it can be only used for the cooking oil and also some of the applications like uh, preparing the mayonnaise, salad dressing, and also etc. So if you want to produce the hard stock products like margarine and also the shortening using the soybean oil, right? Most of the time we have to use the hydrogenated soybean oil. So we know that the hydrogenation actually is uh, one of the methods that can be used to produce the plastic fat, okay? So after we have produced the hydrogenated uh, soybean oil, we will be able to produce the hard stock products like the margarine and also the shortening. But the problem with this hydrogenated solid soybean oil is that hydrogenated soybean oil will cause the adverse health effects. So that's why, that's why this is very important for us to try to reduce the amount of the trans fat in our food. So we know that if let's say we consume too much of this uh, trans, fat, uh, trans fatty acid, it will cause a lot of these, uh, what we call the health, uh, health effects. Uh, I, I would say the adverse health effects, like for example, it will reduce the good cholesterol. And also at the same time, it will increase the cholesterol build up. So which leads to the uh, heart diseases and also the strokes. So that's why, it's very important for us try to reduce the amount of trans fat in our food. So hydrogenation of the soybean oil basically is not one of the methods uh, that uh, to produce a hard stock product. So this is the first thing. Then after that, uh, how about the palm oil? We also know, uh, we know that the palm oil actually is one of the very important vegetable oils as well. And also is very high in the palmitate and also the oleic acids. And also it has quite a lot of applications that it can be applied uh, as a cooking oil and also it can be applied, as, uh, it can be used as margarine, it can be utilized as a shortening and also as a trough. Okay, it depends on the fractions that we are talking about. So this, uh, that's why palm oil is commonly used uh, uh, in the food industry. 
But the problem with these oils and fats is that if let's say we consume too much of these oils and fats, right, it will cause uh, obesity or overweight. And also, I'm sorry to say that uh, Malaysia is ranked number one uh, when we are thinking about the overweight population in the Southeast Asia. Okay, so if let's say we take in too much of fats and also coupled with the excessive intake of the sugar and also inadequate exercises and so on, right? Eventually, it will cause the obesity and also the overweight. So basically, this is not a good uh, phenomenon. So if let's say we want to solve this kind of questions, uh, we want to solve this kind of problem, right? Uh, basically, there are several possible solutions for it. Like for example, we can do regular exercises. We can use uh, some of the fat replacers like the protein place, uh, protein based uh, replacer, uh, carbohydrate based uh, replacer, or maybe we can uh, have the medications as well. But the problem with all these possible solution is that uh, we know that Malaysia actually uh, they are having a very hectic time. Uh, they are having a very uh, busy schedule. Most of the time, they do not have the time. Uh, do, they do not have the time to do the exercise. And also, even though you, we try to uh, replace the fats and oil using the protein-based uh, fat replacer or the carbohydrate-based uh, fat replacer, so the quality of the food uh, will be reduced. Okay, because it cannot give the exact. Uh, sensory attributes uh, to the food. If let's say we replace the fats and oil by using all these fat replacer, and also we cannot rely on the medications as well because the rely uh, the reliance of the on the medication actually is bad for health. So I would say exercises, uh, exercise, uh, fat replacer, medication that seems uh, possible, but is not the exact solution to this what we call the overweight and also the obesity. So. The current disclosure of the diazole glycerol oil, right, is maybe a possible solution for it. Because based on the previous literature, uh, it stated that this diazole glycerol is able to reduce the body weight and also the abdominal fat. It can enhance the fat oxidation, lower the serum triazole glycerol concentration. And also most importantly is that this uh, diazole glycerol oil has a grass status is generally regarded as safe. And also, not to mention that this diazole glycerol oil has a very good mass fire and also the stabilizing properties. But before we further discuss about this diazole glycerol oil, what exactly is this diazole glycerol oil? So if let's say you look at the structures over here, basically when we are thinking about the conventional oil, it will have three fatty acids esterified to the glycerol backbone. But this glycerol, diazole glycerol oil, right? We will have two fatty acid esterified to the glycerol backbone on it at the position of, of one and three. So uh, previous study states that uh, if let's say we take in this what we call the diazole glycerol oil, it will have different metabolism pathway as compared to this what we call the conventional uh, diazole triazole glycerol oil. So I will use the TAG to represent the triazole glycerol oil or we call it as the conventional oil. And then I will use the DAG to represent the diazole glycerol oil. So as what you can see from the diagrams over here, upon the, uh, when we ingest, uh, when we ingest with, uh, the TAG oil and also the DAG oil, right? The way that the TAG and also the DAG uh, are metabolized, I mean, digested will be totally different. We can see over here when we are talking about the TAG oil. So when we absorb, when we ingest this, what we call the DAG, TAG oil, this DAG oil will be, will be digested by the blood base. And then it will form the two MAG and also the free fatty acid. So these two MAG and also the free fatty acid will be absorbed by the intestinal epithelial cells. So once it's in the epi intestinal epithelial cells, these two MAG and also the FFA, the free fatty acid, will be re-esterified back to this what we call the triazide glycerol oil and before it's, being, uh, developed, before it's being delivered to the intestinal limb. But when we are thinking about the diazole glycerol oil, right, the way that it metabolizes is totally different. We can see here, once we ingest this, what we call the diazole glycerol oil, the DAG oil, so it will still be digested and then it will form the 1,3-MAG together with the free fatty acid. 
So similarly, this one tree MAG and also the free fatty acid will be absorbed by the intestinal epithelial cells. But this one tree MAG and also the free fatty acid, they are not capable, I mean, they are not easily resynthesized re back into this, what we call the TAG. Okay, so that's why you will be able to reduce the triacid guys' raw concentration in the blood, uh, in the uh, blood serums. Uh, uh, instead of we synthesize back into this TAG, right? This one we call the one tree MAG and also the FFA will be delivered to the liver and uh, burn it to produce the energy. So that's why if let's say we consume the DAG oil, it will be able to reduce the re synthesize of this what we call the TAG in our body. So in other words, it will be able to reduce uh, the accumulations of this triacid gastro oil in our body. So that's why DAG oil would be a possible solution to this opacity and also the overweight problem. So the second part of this, uh, what we call the presentation, I will talk about the objective of the project. Okay, so currently the problem statement is that uh, we have the soybean oil. As well, I told you guys that when we are looking about soybean oil, yes, limited applications because it's considered as a soft oil. So I will say that the soybean oil has a very low solid fat content. It cannot be made into a hard stock products like the margarine or the shortening. So in order for us to solve this kind of problem, hydrogenation definitely is not the solution. Okay, because it will produce a lot of this, uh, what we call the trans fatty acid. So if that's the case, right, basically we can do the oil blending. Okay, we can do the oil blending. We can add in the palm oil into the soybean oil in order for us to increase the solid fat contents of the soybean oil. But as what I mentioned earlier, the consumption of the uh, fats and excessive consumption of fats and oils will eventually lead to this uh, obesity and also the uh, overweight problem. So that's why in this study, why we are going to produce the palm-based diet of some guys raw oil. And then this pump-based diazide guys oil, uh, this pump-based diazide guys oil has a very high solid fat content. And also not to mention its anti-obesity properties. So for this project, I'm going to incorporate this pump-based DAG oil into the soybean oil, and then we will be able to produce uh, various types of uh, products that we want in the future. We will be able to produce the hard stock products with health benefits as well. So. The objective of this project, basically, we want to modify uh, the physical chemical properties of the soybean oil. Uh, during the presentation, I will use the SPO to represent the soybean oil. And also, uh, we are going to modify the physical chemical properties through blending with the palm-based diacylgastro oil. So I will use the PDAG to represent the palm-based DAG oil. Then after that, based on the blending and also the physical chemical changes when uh, we are having the blends, right, we will be able to determine the suitable fats and oil blends for different food applications, uh, particularly the hard stock products. So this will be the uh, this will be the objective. This will be the objective for my project. So what will be the methodology? Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is that we need to prepare the PDAG. So all we need to do is that we have to conduct the enzymatic gastrolysis uh, with the Novozyme 435. Uh, it's a kind of the lipase base uh, provided by the Novozyme uh, in the pet pet reactors. After we have prepared the crude PDAG, right, we will do the purifications. So we will do the purifications uh, using the two-step molecular distillation steps. After we get the purified PDAG, uh, we will do the refining process. We will do the uh, refining, the bleaching, and also the deodorize to get the refined bleach and also the deodorized pump uh, PDAG. So once we have this, what we call the refined uh, RBD, RBD just means the refined bleach and also the deodorized palm oil, uh, sorry, PDAG. And then this will be our finished product. And then we are going to uh, incorporate this, what we call the RBD, PDAG into the soybean oil. So what we are going to do next is that we are going to uh, incorporate the soybean oil. We, we are trying to incorporate the PDAG oil 
PDAG into the SBO. So we, uh, we will be able, we will, we will have 11 plans in total. So basically we are trying to incorporate the PDAG at a 10% increment each. So we will have the plan A with 0% uh, of the PDAG and also the SBO is 100%. Then after that, each time we will increase 10% of the PDAG into the plans. So total up together, we will have 11 plans. Then after that, once we have the plans, right, we will carry out the physical chemical analysis. We will analyze the physical chemical properties of the oil plants. So some of the uh, properties that we are going to investigate will be like the fatty acid composition, acyl glycerol composition, iodine value, and also the melting and crystallization profile of the oil plants. So this will be the results and discussion. So what we, what we can see over here is that when we are thinking about the soybean oil, right, we can see that the soybean oil has a high concentration of this, what we call the oleic acid, and also the linoleic acid, and also the linoleic acid. So linoleic acid will contribute to about 52.3% uh, of the total fatty composition of the soybean oil. When we have, when we are in, when we are looking at the PDAG oil, we will be able to see that this PDAG oil will have a higher concentration of this palmitic acid and also the oleic acid. Okay, so when we are trying to incorporate the PDAG into the soybean oil, what we observe is that it will change the fatty acid profile of the oil plants. We can see there will be a drastic reduction in the linoleic acid and also the linolenic acids. Okay, so the linoleic acid is represented by the red bars and also the linoleic acid is represented by the blue bars. We can see that there's a drastic drop, uh, there's a gradual, gradual drop in the, in, the fat, uh, in the linolenic acid and also the linolenic acid, okay, for the soybean oil. And at the same time, right, we'll be able to see that there's increase in the concentration of the palmitic acid as well, okay? And also we will be able to see there is a slow increase in the oleic acid as well. Okay, because we know that for both the uh, PDAG oil and also the soybean oil, they contain significant amount of this, what we call the oleic acid. So even though we incorporate the PDAG into the soybean oil, it does not uh, really increase uh, drastically. Uh, I mean the oleic oil, oleic acid does not really increase drastically. So based on the fatty acid composition, I would say that this is one of the very important information uh, for the food industry. Because as what is mentioned by the first speaker today, right? They say that it's very important for us to have a very balanced uh, fatty acid uh, profile in our diet. Not, we are staring at, uh, I, I would say that even though when we are talking about the saturated fatty acid, it does not mean that the saturated fatty acid is bad to our health. We need to have a balanced fatty acid diet instead of just uh, focusing on the unsaturated fatty acid. So it's very important for us to have a, a balanced fatty acid composition. So based on this, what we call the profile, right? The food industry will be able to select, okay, the oil blends that they want, okay, to be produced as a cooking oil. If let's say they want to produce a cooking oil with balanced fatty acid profile, so they can rely on this, what we call the acid, fatty acid composition of the oil blends. So if let's say they want to have a very balanced, uh, uh, what we call the acid profile between the saturated fatty acid and also the unsaturated fatty acid, or maybe they can opt for this of uh, 40% and 60% of the PDAG to uh, SBO, or maybe can they opt for this 50% and 50% of this PDAG and also SBO. So this will be one of the important information about the oil blend. Then other than this, right, we also uh, calculate the unsaturated fatty acid and also the saturated fatty acid. So we know that this saturated, unsaturated fatty acid is predominantly pre pre found in the uh, soybean oil. When we are talking about the PDAG, right? Another five minutes, yeah. Oh, Thank okay, you. okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so for the PDAG, we will have a high amount of this SFA. Uh, I mean the saturated fatty acid. So 
the composition of this what we call the unsaturated set, uh, unsaturated fatty and acid, and also the saturated fatty acid. Basically, it will affect the physical chemical properties of the oil blends. Okay. Then after that, we also investigated the iodine value uh, for the oil blends as well. We can see that there is a, a slow drop or gradual drop in the iodine value for the oil blends. So we can see that the soybean oil, the SBO, will have the highest iodine value, while the PDAG will have the lowest uh, iodine value. So the incorporations of this, what we call the PDAG into the SBO, definitely will reduce the iodine value of the oil blend. But does it mean it, this is bad? But I, I would say that this is not something bad because we want to produce a hard stock product, right? Most of the time when we think about a hard stock product, it will have a very uh, low iodine value. Uh, and also this iodine value definitely will affect the physical properties of the oil blends. Then after that, we also investigated this uh, acyl glycerol composition of the oil blends as well. We know that the PDAG that we purified uh, previously has a high concentration of this, what we call the diacyl glycerol, the DAG. And also for the soybean oil, basically it's a conventional triacyl glycerol oil. So we can see here is that for the SBO, it will have a very high concentration of S, uh, TAG. And also when we are talking about the PDAG, it will have a high concentration of this uh, DAG. So the incorporation of this, what we call the PDAG into the SBO will reduce the uh, DAG con content. And also at the same time, it will increase the concentration of this DAG. Okay, so uh, this is the, this is the, what we call the observations that uh, is reported. Then after that, we will look at the crystallization profile as well. What we can see over here is that, what we can see over here is that, when we are talking about the soybean oil, it will have a low melting points at around negative nine degrees Celsius. And also when we are talking about the PDAG, we will have a very high melting points and also you will have three peaks. So the incorporations, I would say in overall, we will have two regions. One of the regions is what we known as the low melting regions. And then the other regions will be the high melting regions. So the incorporations of this, what we call the PDAG will increase, okay? Will increase the uh, crystallization profile, the crystallization onset temperature of the oil plants. Based on the information that we obtained, right? I would say that the sample C and D may be suitable for the margarine products. Then after that, we will have for the mountain profiles of the oil blends as well. We can see that we will have several regions as usual uh, as uh, for the similar to that of the crystallization profile. So we will have the low melting regions and also we will have high melting regions as well. So the PDA, the DAG will have a pit with higher melting points as illustrated by P5. Okay, because of the presence of the high saturated fatty acid and also the DAG content with the hydroxyl groups because there will be more interactions between the oil particles and also the oil molecules so that's why the dag if let's say uh, the pdag will have a higher melting points as compared to this what we call the soybean oil so based on the results that we observe right i would say that if all, in order for us to produce the margarine or also the softening we need to have certain uh, amount of these solid fats content uh, at the room temperatures so based on the results that we obtain, I would say that 30 to 70 and also uh, 40 to 60 or 50 to 50 will be uh, the appropriate, uh, what we call the concentration between the SPO and also the PDAG to produce the margarine and also the sharpening. Yeah, so in conclusion, I would say that the incorporation of the PDAG into an SPO can, could enhance the physical chemical properties of the SPO, thereby extending its food application. So, and also in, uh, we know that the DAG can also uh, improve the nutritional value of the oil plants as well. So that's why this is a very, uh, I would say useful project and to give an, an insight and useful information about what are the plants that we should use to produce the cooking oil and well, which are which plant that we should use to produce the margarine and also the chocolate based on the melting and also the crystallization profile. So uh, these are the references. Uh, thank you for your attention.
and also this will be the paper published. Thank you very much. So any questions? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Fua, for a very interesting talk on this uh, topic. Uh, I just allow one question. Anyone have questions? You can unmute yourself and then ask questions, or you can type in the Q&A sections so we can read out your questions. Uh, Dr. Po, I see you that you have a very good uh, research output from these uh, uh, topics, right? Uh, and the article is there. Uh, I think the due to the time limitation, maybe can you share the link for the articles, right? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Your email sure, no address problem. Down in the uh, Q&A sessions. If anyone wants to ask questions, they can email you, right? Okay, or they can download your papers. Or your yeah, sure, sure, sure. Anything? I will share my content and also I will share the link for the papers as well later on. Yep. At this moment, can you type on the uh, the chat box so that people are able to download your article and also your email as well? Is it possible? Uh, I think I may need some time because I need to search for the link as well. Okay, yeah, okay. but I can... Well, I can like email address will do. Yeah, email address. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, I see that there are no questions so far. And due to time limitations, I think, uh, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Pua, for your talks. Dr. Song Che Pin from School of Engineering Monash University. She will share this uh, topic entitled Biocatalytics Production of Biodiesel from Farm Based Waste or Using Low Cost Lipid uh, Liquid Lipase. Okay. Uh, let me read about uh, his uh, biography. Dr. Chapin received his uh, PhD from Monash University in Malaysia. He later worked as a lecturer and researcher at the same university. He had been working on research project in the field of palm oil for more than five years. His research area is in the biocatalysis, biofuel, and also food engineering. For the past couple of years, he has been investigating and designing the processes to utilize palm-based waste as a source for biodiesel, production using the enzymatic roots. So without further delay, uh, I would like to invite again Dr. Che to present his topic. Uh, thanks, Professor uh, Joan, uh, for the kind introduction. Can you all hear me? And also, can you all see the slides that I'm sharing right now? Okay, a uh, very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank you again uh, to the organizer for providing me this opportunity to share some of uh, the research work that done by my team. Uh, and my name is Chirpin. Uh, I'm from the Chemical Engineering Department of Monash University of Malaysia. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the process that we are developing uh, basically to improve the sustainability of our distribution uh, using an enzymatic approach. So I believe no one in this room would disagree with me if I were to say that uh, climate change is indeed one of the biggest concerns among the global communities. Uh, and the major culprit of this global issue uh, is actually none other than greenhouse gas emission uh, from the combustion of fossil fuel. As of today, 84% uh, uh, of our energy, the world energy, is actually provided by the fossil fuel. And the transportation industry itself already contributes up to 50% of the fossil fuel consumption. That's this tagline uh, that we often use in Monash, uh, that is, uh, if you don't like something, change it. Therefore, if we really want to address this uh, climate issue, right, we certainly will have to make uh, changes to the existing transportation sector. And since the current transportation scheme is uh, mostly the petrol diesel base, biodiesel has been widely viewed as the potential substitute uh, for the petrol diesel. This is because uh, biodiesel can be used directly in the diesel powered vehicle with little to even no engine uh, modification. And more importantly, it can be found, I mean, uh, studies has really found that uh, the emission of greenhouse gases by the combustion of pure biodiesel is about 70% lesser as compared to petrol diesel. And of course, uh, biodiesel is mostly produced from vegetable oil, which is a type of renewable source. So if we could continue planting new crops, basically we would not run out of feedstock for biodiesel production. Uh, when we talk about biodiesel in our region, right, uh, the first feedstock that will come into our mind is uh, without a doubt palm oil. This is because uh, Malaysia is... Uh, the main, uh, one of the main uh, palm oil producers. In fact, it's the second largest in the world. Uh, and in 2019 itself, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia both uh, produce a combined total of 16 million ton of palm oil. And among these amount of palm oil produced by these two countries, uh, it's almost 
ton of uh, eight million ton of these uh, palm oil was actually used in these two countries to produce biodiesel. Over here, uh, this is just a, a simple illustration of a simplified uh, palm oil manufacturing process. So currently, the crude palm oil, or in short, we call it CPO, uh, is one of the favorite choices uh, to be used as the pit stop for biodiesel production. And here comes the first problem, because CPO is also used to produce refined cooking oil, as we all know. So which one is more important? Uh, is it putting the food on the table or actually filling up the vehicle? Well, I believe in this room, everyone has already heard about uh, the, this uh, food versus fuel debate, uh, and it has been ongoing for quite some time right now. So my team believe if we really want to make production of biodiesel sustainable, we will need to look for alternative feed stocks, uh, preferably the non-edible ones. So if we look closer in the palm oil processing line, right, there are several types of low quality oils that are being constantly produced throughout the manufacturing process. So for example, uh, sludge palm oil over here, uh, the palm pressed fiber oil are actually produced during the milling process. And we also produce uh, these uh, palm fatty acid distillate uh, from the uh, deodorization process. Uh, they are being classified as low quality oil, mainly because they contain high amount of impurities uh, such as free fatty acids and also uh, water. And pretty much they have very limited applications as well. And more importantly, they cannot be served as food. So if we compare between the edible and also the non-edible feedstock, the low quality oil will definitely have the upper hand in terms of cost, as well as uh, avoiding the food versus fuel debate. Uh, the trade-off is that uh, if the low quality oil is being used as a feedstock for biodiesel production, of course, the conventional and the very well-established alkaline catalyzed process cannot be adopted. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the low quality oil, they usually contain high amount of free, free fatty acids. And these free fatty acids will have the tendency to react with the alkaline catalyst to form soap and will eventually lead to significant new loss. So one way to overcome this is, of course, to introduce a two-step uh, acid alkaline catalyzed process where we can first esterify the free fatty acid to form uh, metal ester using the acid catalyst and followed by trans-esterifying the glycerides into metal ester using the alkaline catalyst. Well, if we involve acid into the picture, then it will uh, raise concerns on the safety part of the process. And also it probably will require regular maintenance since uh, the acid is a very uh, corrosive material. Uh, another alternative uh, is of course to use enzyme as the biocatalyst, I mean, as, as the biocatalyst to use uh, the biodiesel from the low quality lipid fit stock. So here are some of the advantages offered by the enzymatic process. Uh, I would like to specifically mention a few of them. So firstly, enzymatic process, usually they will require less energy as compared to the chemical route. This is because the enzymatic process typically operated under a uh, mild condition uh, as the enzyme uh, will denature if they are being exposed to high temperature and also pressure. Another advantage uh, that uh, we could get from enzymatic process is that enzyme is highly specific. So what it means is that uh, it will only catalyze very specific reaction. And this also means that uh, there will be minimum to even no site reactions. And hence the product that we will be getting usually will have high purity if the conversion is high enough. So lipase is uh, the enzyme that we commonly use to produce biodiesel. Uh, okay, it has ability to catalyze uh, three uh, reactions, the trans and also the esterification as well as the hydrolysis. So this means that we, if we use our uh, enzyme as the biocatalyst, we can convert both uh, the TAG and also the free fatty acids into metal ester simultaneously. To be honest, uh, the use of a biocatalyst in biodiesel production is not something really entirely new. Uh, there were several prior attempts as shown in this table. Uh, however, we could see that the combustion is either still not meeting the product specs uh, as highlighted over here, or they could, if, uh, they could achieve a high combustion, but would require much longer processing time or even a very high enzyme uh, loading over here. So uh, uh, this generally has made uh, enzymatic process for biodiesel production uh, very unattractive. But a few years back, uh, our industrial collaborator has uh, formulated a new liquid enzyme known as Evosal Samsung 2.0. And this enzyme is actually obtained from the genetically modified uh, aspergillus origin. And what's so special about this enzyme is that it's significantly cheaper than the conventional enzyme. If we were to put them on a scale where we have the chemical catalyst on the left-hand side, and we take a 
RM1 ringgit per kg as uh, the basis. Uh, and the enzyme used in the previous studies, uh, sitting at the other end of the, the scale, with a cost ranging from 100 to maybe 100, uh, 1,000 times higher than the chemical catalyst. So guess where we can find Avastar 2.0? Well, it will only be 15 times more expensive than the chemical catalyst. Yes, it's still expensive, but it's significantly cheaper as compared to the conventional uh, enzyme used in the previous study for biodiesel production. So we believe this is uh, really a game changer in terms of commercializing uh, these uh, enzymatic biodiesel products. So what my team uh, has been doing is to develop an enzymatic process for biodiesel production that is efficient uh, and also economical and also sustainable. And to achieve this objective, we conduct uh, feasibility studies uh, on the use of this Evosa Transform 2.0 to convert various low quality oils into biodiesel. And we design a process intensification method so that we could achieve higher conversion in a shorter time. And uh, also we conduct uh, these uh, techno economic uh, and also life cycle analysis to determine how viable uh, the process is. And due to the time constraint, I could only cover the first part of our research uh, in today's presentation. And hopefully I could share with you guys on other topics uh, maybe in uh, the near future. So this is the setup that we use uh, in the MIPO lab uh, to perform the feasibility, uh, feasibility studies and also uh, determine the process operating condition uh, for the enzymatic biodiesel production. So over here, we have the one liter jacketed reactor equipped with an overhead stirrer and also connected to the water buff. And in this presentation, I'll be focusing on the use of sludge pump oil, but I'll give you uh, an overview uh, what are the achievements that we have done with also uh, the other fit stops. Okay, so this is how it actually looks like during the reaction. It's always good to have a glass reactor so, uh, for research purposes because uh, we get to see what's really happening inside the reactor when we make changes you know, to the operating conditions. So samples are actually taken uh, periodically and subjected to uh, is FFA and also FAME analysis using auto titrator and also GCFID respectively. So all these uh, analytical instruments can also be found in the MIPO lab. Okay, so uh, now let's move on to the results and discussion. Uh, the first investigation that we conducted was to determine the optimum methanol to oil molar ratio in order to achieve a high conversion. Uh, this part is a bit tricky because uh, exposing the lipase to high methanol concentration could potentially denature the enzyme. On the other hand, we actually need high methanol concentration to shift the reaction to the product side because it's a reversible reaction. So to minimize the enzyme inhibition, uh, instead of uh, you know, for us dose in all the methanol in one shot, we carry out the experiment by continuously dosing the methanol across the first four hours. But then we will run the reaction all the way uh, to 24 hours to see what is the, uh, the, the maximum achievable film conversion. So from the figure on the left-hand side over here, we could see how the fame and also the FFA content uh, changes uh, throughout the reaction. The one uh, at the top here representing the fame, and the one uh, at the bottom over here representing the FFA. And uh, the figure on the right-hand side, uh, you can find the final fame and also FFA contents uh, com uh, obtained at the 24 hours. Basically, we are just translating these uh, data into the bar chart for easy uh, for, for comparison purposes. Okay, uh, so we could see that uh, the fame content actually increased from 81.8%, uh, sorry, 81.8% uh, to 89.1% with increasing molar ratio from 3 to 1 to 5 to 1. So this is actually quite expected because a higher molar ratio can uh, enhance the forward reaction, thus leading to a higher fame production. However, the ester content was found to decrease from 81% uh, down to 70. 8.1% uh, when the molar ratio increased further to 6.1, uh, 6 to 1, sorry. So uh, we speculated that uh, this elevated methanol concentration might have already inhibited the catalytic activity of the liquid enzyme at this level over here. So after knowing that uh, 4 to 1 molar ratio is sufficient for us to actually achieve a fame conversion uh, up to 88%, we were thinking what would happen if we split the methanol dosing into two stages? Could we even achieve a higher conversion by adding even more methanol to shift the reaction forward? At the same time, you know, minimizing the uh, exposure of enzyme to the methanol. So uh, what we have done over here is that we conducted experiments by introducing additional one to one and five to one, sorry, it's one to one, two five to one uh, methanol to all molar ratio in stage two uh, 
on top of the four to one molar ratio uh, that we introduced in stage one. Okay, so what we discover is that the additional of these two to one molar ratio in stage two, uh, two to one actually will give us a total of six to one. If you remember in stage one, everyone will be first uh, introduced to this uh, four to one molar ratio and stage two, when we, add, when we add in additional two to one, so that results a total of six to one uh, methanol to oil molar ratio. So what we discovered is that uh, the conversion uh, is now 89.6%. And if you refer to my previous data, right, we actually conducted this experiment at six to one and we found out that the, the, these uh, maximum achievable fame con uh, content was actually only 78.1%. So this means that uh, even though we are now introducing the same amount of methanol as compared to uh, first stage dosing one shot, uh, by splitting into two stages, we could really, uh, improve the conversion by shifting reaction forward at the same time, minimizing uh, these, uh, uh, what they call methanol inhibition factors on the enzyme. So what we can conclude from this finding is that uh, a two-stage dosing will definitely uh, make the process a faster, uh, higher conversion, as well as uh, minimizing the enzyme uh, deactivation. Next, what we investigated is the effects of uh, enzyme loading on the conversion. So uh, we observe a shift in reaction rate quite prominently from 0.2% uh, of enzyme to 0.7% of enzyme, as indicated by the change in the slope of this graph over here. Right, and uh, this is because more enzymes were now available to bind with the substrates and thereby uh, increasing the probability for the reactions to occur between the uh, reactants. And the FAME content was also found to increase uh, all the way to 95.8% at 0.7% of enzyme. But if we further increase the enzyme concentration, it doesn't give any noticeable change in the rate of reaction. Uh, over here, you don't see a significant change in terms of gradient, as well as the final conversion over here. So uh, we believe this is due to the uh, saturation as there were more enzyme now uh, than the substrates present in the reaction mixture. So there's no point for us to continue just increasing the enzyme concentration. It will just increase the operating cost, but will not give us any positive side. And what would happen if we increase the stirring speed of the agitator? Once again, we could see the, there's an increase in rate of reaction uh, as indicated by the shift of the gradient uh, with increasing the speed of reaction, uh, sorry, the speed of the, the stirring. Uh, the final film content was also found to be higher over here. Uh, and the higher speed would actually increase the binding of uh, the enzyme and also the substrate by enhancing the mass transfer between uh, these two components. Uh, and we also discovered that uh, with increasing the stirring speed beyond this point over here, uh, there will be no noticeable change uh, in the rate of reaction. Again, uh, you don't see a, an obvious change in the, the gradient. Uh, but what's surprising us is that uh, there was actually a slight drop in, in, the, in the, this uh, fame uh, conversion. So uh, we suspect that this uh, is because the intense mixing might have promoted the methanol evaporation. Uh, causing the loss of this uh, reactant. Uh, and there is also a possibility that uh, the enzyme structure might have already affect be affected by intense uh, physical force created by this mixing. So then we can't just, uh, you know, for the sake of improving the rate of reaction, we just uh, non-stop increasing the, the uh, stirring speed because there's a, there's a limit that we, can, we, can, uh, we cannot cross. And lastly, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You have another sorry. five minutes. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, so yeah. lastly, we have also investigated the effects of temperature on the conversion. So generally speaking, the higher the temperature uh, would increase the kinetic uh, energy of the molecule and can boost the collision frequency between the enzyme and also the substrates. It also helps to reduce the viscosity, uh, in turn enhance the mass transfer. Um, however, as mentioned earlier, enzyme is a biological component it has its own preferred temperature. So uh, beyond this temperature, right, the enzyme would slowly uh, lose its structure and also activity. Uh, and based on the results, what we can conclude over here is that Evosar from 2.0 generally works well uh, between 35 to 45 degrees Celsius. So you can see this operating temperature is significantly lower than the, the, the well-established alkaline, uh, alkaline catalyzed process, thereby we can save some energy over there. Uh, so with the experimental uh, data that we've collected in the previous sections, we are now able to produce biodiesel from sludge palm oil using this uh, Everstar from 2.0. Uh, 
as the biocatalyst, uh, and we can achieve a final fame of about 94%, uh, and also the FFA content uh, 3%. But 3% FFA uh, is not acceptable because uh, based on the EN specification stated over here, right, the FFA content in biodiesel has to be below uh, 0.2%. Uh, therefore, we, have, uh, we conducted a simple post-treatment process to reduce the FFA content via uh, what we call the neutralization and also water washing. And ultimately, we have successfully produced a biodiesel with this property over here, meeting all the essential uh, biodiesel specification listed by the EN standards. Uh, so what we can conclude at this point is that uh, Eversource Transform 2.0 has opened up the possibility in commercializing the enzymatic biodiesel production. So the next problem that we need to overcome is of course the long processing time because uh, as you may aware from the previous data, we run the reaction for nearly uh, 24 hours. So uh, in fact, our team is actually uh, already working on this, uh, working on this uh, aspect. We are trying to implement what we call the diesel electric devices to enhance the mass transfer between uh, enzyme and also the substrates. Uh, besides that, our team is also investigating the quality of the biodiesel by combusting them using a diesel generator, and we monitor the gas emission as well as the gas, uh, I mean the energy output. We also have uh, this crazy idea of creating this renewable energy access uh, in the rural areas by co-producing biodiesel in the rural uh, palm oil mills, uh, and we come up with a case study based on a medium-sized palm oil mill and evaluated the economic uh, feasibility of the process as well as the environmental impact. So that's just a sneak peek of what our, our team has been working on uh, related to uh, biodiesel production. So before I uh, end my presentation, we'd just like to take this opportunity to really thank uh, MIPO for supporting the research work. In case you're not aware, uh, MIPO Lab uh, has a wide range of uh, process equipment and also analytical instruments dedicated for oil and fats research. There were even pilot scale reactors that can be found in the lab and my team actually has used these big reactors to carry out scale up studies uh, for our enzymatic biodiesel processes. Uh, you can uh, visit MIPO website by scanning this QR code and to find out more about the facilities available. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, Mohi for uh, FRGS grant and also our industrial collaborators for providing us all the materials. Uh, and these are just the members of our, our oil and fats uh, research team. So from the photo, it seems like we, we play more than we work. <laughs> this is the strategy, how we attract people to join our team. Anyway, going back to what uh, IOCOA uh, has just shared with us earlier today, if we really want to advance further, we must, not, uh, we must work hand in hand instead of uh, working in silo, right? So do contact us uh, if there's any way that we could uh, you know, uh, collaborate. And we can be reached via these two emails. The first one is myself, and of course, you can also contact our Prof Chan uh, using this email over here. And of course, if you're interested to join uh, our research team, you may also contact us via these, uh, these two emails. So uh, with that, I will end my presentation, and thank you so much for your time. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cho, for a very uh, interesting talk on the IPs for biodiesel productions. Okay, any questions from the member of the floor? Let me see. Uh, any questions? May, uh, maybe I just ask one question. Uh. Right. Uh, Dr. Cho, you have done the lipase. As you see, the uh, price is very expensive, 50 times more expensive. Correct. Compared with Novozyme, which is the immobilized uh, lipase, right? Mm -hmm. Which is used for biodiesel productions. Right. So uh, the question is, uh, do you manage to compare the price and second, uh, is it uh, your cat lipase can be reused? Because uh, Novozyme can reuse quite some, quite some couple of times, like at least 10 times though. Thank you. All right. Okay, uh, thanks for the questions, uh, Professor John. So just to just to let you know, in fact, this uh, episode from 2.0 is also actually formulated by uh, Novozyme. It's their latest uh, liquid enzyme used in biodiesel production. So it was found that, in fact, this uh, information was provided by, uh, by them saying that it's the cheapest uh, liquid enzyme available for existing the cheapest enzyme available for biodiesel production and it's found to be 50, it's about 15 times more expensive compared to uh, these uh, uh, alkaline uh, catalysts for example sodium hydroxide well 15 percent i mean 15 times is indeed a, a very huge number but not forgetting the amount that we'll be using is in fact just 0.2 weight percent and typically for sodium hydroxide we are looking at uh, the minimum is one percent so we have five times less, uh, we, we, we use five times less in terms of amount uh, for these uh, catalysis. So 
you know, when we talk about 15 times, now we can reduce another five times. So we're talking about probably three times more expensive. So what we need to do right now is basically just a concept proof saying that if this enzyme can be recycled more than three times, uh, basically this can actually make the entire process quite, quite economical viable. In fact, we have students uh, repeated uh, these uh, recyclability, I mean, conducted an, uh, an experiment to study the recyclability of this enzyme. And at the moment, we found out that up to six times, there's no significant drop in terms of the, the performance. So we will, of course, uh, right now, the informations are still uh, in the validation stage. Uh, so we will not share too much about this at the moment. So just stay tuned for our latest results. Huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, any other You're questions? Welcome. If no, then we move to our next speaker. Okay, thanks right. again, Dr. Thank Chow. you. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hari Krishna. He is the Chief Research and Human Officer for Sam uh, Plantation Research in Denver uh, He will share with us a talk entitled Innovation in Oil Palm Milling uh, Process and also Bioeconomical Opportunities. Uh, let me uh, read out his uh, short biography. Dr. Hari Krishnan completed his first degree in plant sciences from the University of London and completed his PhD in plant development and molecular biology at University of Lanchester, UK. Prior to joining Simon Derby uh, Technology Center in July 2003, Dr. Hari Krishna was a postdoc fellow at University of California working on plant molecular biology, R and B, and started his earlier career in Malaysia at Golden Hope Plantation, followed by academic career at UC Puta, Malaysia, UPN, where he was a visiting scientist at the MIT, Cambridge, working on the development of new tools for oil palm molecular biology. He has over 30 years postgraduate experience in biotechnology and 2012, he was inducted in the Malaysia Academy of Science as a fellow. In May 2009, Sam Dabi announced that has successfully sequenced, assembled, and annotated the oil pump genome exclusively using a second generation sequencing technology, making the world first company to achieve this scientific breakthrough using this technology. And as the effort spearheaded by Dr. Hari Krishna, in 2016, Simon Levy announced the first commercial scale planting of its genome select oil plum derived from its genomic breakthrough of 2009, with an expected peak oil yield of over 10 tons of oil per hectare. So, uh, without further uh, ado, let us uh, invite Dr. Hari Krishnan. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I'm Dr. Juan from uh, UST Malaya and also represent Institute Kimia Malaysia, IKM, a professional body for chemists. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to share some of my uh, uh, thoughts or the te my, my team's ideas with you today. The topic that uh, I'm covering today is uh, entitled Innovation in Oil Palm Milling, uh, Progress and Circular Bioeconomy uh, Opportunities. My company is 200 years old. I'm not quite that old yet, but I'm getting there, right? As mentioned earlier by uh, Ju. Okay, um, this is the oil palm value chain, right? So uh, Saim Davi Plantation is involved in that whole value chain, starting from actually the production of seeds through uh, planting of the oil palm in the, in the fields, harvesting the crop, transporting it to the mills, processing the crop in the mills, and then sending all those various byproducts to the refineries where it's converted into the final products, right? Uh, um, earlier, you, list, uh, you heard about biodiesel. So biodiesel is one of those products as well. So if we start thinking about um, what is happening today, given all the climate change, ESGs, and so on and so forth that uh, everybody is, is, is talking about, uh, what is the current status in the industry with regards to actually uh, circularizing uh, some of these uh, processes and products. So if you, if you have a look at this, uh, this uh, image here and we start off with the oil palm plantation itself, the fronds and trunks are already being recycled. So all the nutrients are being recycled. 
um, on the carbon is being recycled um, um, to those plum, uh, palms when, when we uh, conduct re uh, replanting programs. <clears throat> From the oil palm mills, the fresh fruit bunches uh, are stripped and the empty fruit branches are either returned in that form to the field or uh, converted into uh, compost and then returned to the field. So in that manner also it's sort of recycled, right? The palm oil mill effluent is treated in effluent treat treatment plants and at the moment um, there are different discharge parameters um, uh, depending on where you operate and, and um, then that water is discharged according to the uh, regulator's uh, parameters. In some cases, uh, it's economic for us to convert the biogas in these effluent treatment plants through using a biogas uh, engine or co-firing a boiler to produce electricity that then can go to the grid or else can go to fire up the uh, oil palm mill, right? So the fiber and shell is used as fuel for the boilers in a conventional process. Um, as mentioned by the previous speaker, the so-called low quality oil or sludge oil, high, high free fatty acid containing oil uh, is often sent off to the biodiesel plant to be converted into industrial oil or biodiesel. So what are the opportunities um, in the future or those that are currently being explored that actually enhance this uh, so-called recycling or this uh, circularization of this industry? So again, if we start from the uh, palm oil mill, right? And um, from the effluent treatment plant, there are new uh, technologies that allow the water to be treated to a higher standard. And then that water can then be recycled back as boiler water. The uh, empty fruit bunch and pomi can be converted into their uh, respective uh, components and then fermented or bioconverted into uh, products such as bioethanol, bioplastics, or biohydrogen, similar with oil palm trunks as well. So, however, all of these processes today have been explored, but none of them uh, appear to be economically viable at this point in time, given the very high cost of, uh, of the plants that need to be put up. Um, the shell and decanter cake can be used as animal feed and for making uh, other products, industrial products. Um, and from the flue gas from your, uh, from the, from your boilers, uh, these, the carbon, carbon dioxide from there can be recycled through uh, algae farming um, uh, and, and then that algae can be used as feed as well. So kernel expeller is being used as animal feed, uh, mainly for ungulates, but uh, uh, we have a process whereby we uh, convert it into feed that is uh, suitable for chickens as well. So I like to sort of change gears and, and then uh, now talk about another element of sustainability, which is um, productivity, right? So whatever we do, we need to be more, more productive or more efficient. So we need to get more from, from less, essentially, right? So um, what about the mills? Are we able to make the mills more productive? So if you look at the milling process, it's been around since the 1950s, uh, you know, um, and developed from the 1930s, 40s, right? But really from the 1950s, it, um, not many changes have been uh, uh, made to the milling process. However, the requirements of the customers um, have changed. The, the additional requirements uh, from the customers with regards to the quality of oil that is refined. There's more uh, um, from the, um, the authorities, there are more stringent uh, uh, requirements for discharge of wastewater as well as particulate emissions. And then today we need to really look at our so-called carbon footprint, our water footprint, and also our energy footprint, right? Given all the uh, SDGs. Um, then there's also the issue of es essentially running the mill as a food factory. So um, I'm not entirely sure whether all of you know what an oil palm mill sort of process looks like, but I'll, I'll go through it. Um, 
essentially your fruits arrive, they go into these fruit cages, it goes into a sterilizer, um, this is autoclaved uh, under pressure for a particular period of time. What that process does is to kill off all the microbes in, in, in there, as well as uh, loosen the fruitlets from the, the fruit bunch. So then it goes into a bunch stripper where the fruitlets are detached. The fruitlets then go into a digester uh, where they are conditioned, and then uh, a screw press um, where then the, the oil the, or the pressed liquor is produced. The pressed liquor then goes through several different processes before you end up having uh, your fruit palm oil. The nuts and the uh, fiber go into a nut and fiber separator. The nuts then uh, sent into a nut cracker, which then goes through a winnower and then clay bath before you get uh, your palm kernels that are then sent off to the kernel crushing plant. Um, and the fibers then go into a, a cyclone whereby, uh, and the shell, uh, whereby they are then uh, dried and produced to be used as either boiler fuel or for other uh, purposes. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this process is relatively stagnant um, with, because it is very efficient already. It's 92 to 94% efficient, right? So um, the only changes that have been made um, are to add uh, additional uh, process uh, components to it, such as empty fruit uh, bunch press, uh, the uh, fiber to do fi uh, fiber oil extraction using solvents. These are these are things that uh, some some companies do. So um, further improvement is not really viable unless we are able to reduce the number of unit operations, which means that we uh, minimize the losses from them or we are able to come up with a new process to enhance uh, the oil extraction or oil recovery, right? So I'll talk to you a bit about actually a different process that the previous speaker has covered, right? Use of enzymes, right? So I think all of you know what enzymes are already. There's this cartoon here uh, where um, some of the unbroken cells in the diluted crude oil, meaning to say after pressing, uh, it goes into a diluted crude oil tank so um, if, you, if you are able to break open those uh, unbroken cells, you are then able to liberate more oil uh, and enhance the oil extraction rate and minimize losses, of course. So we believe that the oil bearing cells that are unbroken uh, by that uh, process of pressing. So um, in order to, uh, this, is, this is a confocal uh, microscope image of the diluted crude oil either as a control and treated with the enzyme. And um, you can see from the control that the cells are intact, right? But from the enzyme treated, you can see that the cells are broken and the oil droplets are being released uh, into the, uh, the environment, into the aqueous environment, right? Um, and therefore uh, suggesting that we are able to extract more oil uh, if we augment our current process with enzyme. However, as I mentioned earlier, that the process is 94, 92 to 94% efficient. So the type of efficiencies that we're talking about are, are very small and therefore measurement becomes uh, very important. So um, this is the process that we have developed. Um, we actually dose the enzyme um, in the diluted crude oil, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, why do we do so? It's, it is um, less, uh, it's cheaper because you don't have to have uh, uh, large equipment, expensive equipment to, to dose at the uh, diluted crude oil. And uh, we've tested also dosing uh, uh, in the digester. The differences are very small um, and therefore it's a lot more cost effective to actually uh, dose in the diluted crude oil. Uh, we work with our partners, Novozymes, uh, similar with the, uh, the other speaker, the earlier speaker. So, as I mentioned earlier, measurement is very important. Unlike uh, lab experiments where you can control the uh, quality of the crop coming in, in an industrial oil mill, we can't. So the crop varies, the crop quality varies uh, every half an hour. 
right? So it is very difficult to then um, do very accurate measurements or do comparisons. We are lucky that we have a, a twin line mill um, and this twin line mill basically has separate uh, 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 processes after the diluted crude oil tank. So uh, we use a V-notch tank to actually ensure that the oil is, uh, is evenly distributed into the two lines. So each line has all the process equipment uh, associated with the mill, meaning to say its own dedicated clarifier, sludge tank, centrifuge, pure oil tank, purifier, vacuum dryer, and also a measurement tank, right? So um, this, would, this would mean that we are able to dose in one line and use the other line as a control and then swap it over at a different uh, point in time and do a comparison as well. So by doing so, we are able to measure uh, the OER as a, as a uh, function of, uh, of oil in the uh, measurement tank through dipping uh, compared to the total amount of fresh fruit bunches processed and also uh, the total amount of oil recovered versus the total amount of uh, fresh fruit bunch uh, processed. We've also put in uh, many other measurement systems in place, but uh, the gold standard or the traditional way of measuring it still is using dipping or, or uh, yeah, still using dipping. So this is what it looks like. This is the diluted crude oil distribution V-notch tank. Uh, you can see the, the, the V-notch uh, on, the, on the right hand side, uh, which then separates the, the diluted crude oil evenly into the two different lines. And you can see the two tanks, they're the measurement tanks with load cells at the bottom of them. So we have load cell measurement as well as uh, dipping um, uh, from, the, from the amount of oil, right? So we've uh, run this actually three times already, three cycles, and we're on to the fourth cycle at the moment, but the, this data is from two cycles. So of uh, 31 days, and uh, we got a Delta OER increment of 0.72% uh, of uh, oil extraction rate, um, and the 95% confidence interval of between 0 0.56 to 0.89%. As I mentioned earlier, the crop, uh, coming into the mill varies every half an hour. So the oil extraction rate will vary uh, over time. So we've also got third party to validate our data to ensure that uh, it is statistically valid. Um, and it's been verified by CIRIM. Um, and they have verified that uh, all the, the, the process is robust as well as the calculations and the data. So we have an average increment of 0.72% of oil extraction rate. So, so that um, actually um, is a significant improvement um, on the uh, oil extraction at the mill, right? So, um, and the oil that is produced is no different from the oil produced from the conventional process. So we've tested it out, refined it, um, used it for various purposes and uh, the quality is identical. So let me, talk a bit about downstream. So once the, the oil is uh, produced, it's transported either by ship or truck, and then it's uh, stored in, in tanks, um, uh, either at the, uh, the shipyard or at the, at, the, at, the mill, uh, at the refinery. And a quality check is uh, conducted to actually um, look at the parameters that are required to um, uh, then refine this oil. Then degumming is, uh, is uh, conducted whereby the CPO is heated under vacuum with phosphoric acid uh, to separate out the gums. Then it's bleached, it's filtered, it's deodorized, and then it's fractionated. And it's fractionated into uh, stearine and olein. So this is what a normal bulk refinery would do. Uh, there are of course specialist refineries whereby further fractions are, are produced from these uh, components. So if you look at uh, oil palm uh, processing or refining, there are two routes in, uh, that can be taken, either physical refining or chemical refining. Uh, and different refiners use different routes but, uh, or different strategies, but uh, most companies actually use physical refining as it is uh, cheaper and uh, there are less unit uh, losses. The oil produced is more or less identical. Um, 
with with minor with minor differences, right? Um, chemical refining, you're you're most probably able to deal with three MCPD and GE uh, a bit better, or three MCPD a bit better than physical refining. The oils produced are used in many different segments, which is a reason why palm oil um, is uh, widely used and widely grown. Um, it's used commonly for frying, for production of bakery products. So these are things like shorteningings, margarine, vegetable ghee, confectionery. That means uh, chocolate confectionaries, cocoa butter substitutes, uh, filling fats, coatings, and also for health. So things like tocotrienols, the carotenoids, and then speciality ingredients. So things like infant formula ingredients, uh, red palm, uh, superoline, lecithins, and also for animal nutrition, right? So let me just finish off by talking about the challenges uh, and current gaps and limitations, right? So at the moment, given the, the, the issues with uh, uh, COVID, and the closure of borders, we have a severe labor shortage and uh, that has impacted on the productivity of plantations. So there's a lot of work in progress by various companies as well as uh, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board to uh, develop um, mechanical solutions and robotic based solutions to, um, to solve or uh, to, to address these issues, right? As for the mills, the OER is, is a major issue or oil extraction rate. So there, there are different process uh, enhancements that can be done such as digitization. So by, by utilizing uh, sensors and digital technology and IoT, we are able to really um, ensure that the process is as efficient as possible. And then um, essentially what I shared with you of the use of enzymes um, as a way to uh, enhance the oil uh, extraction. Then uh, production of premium oils. So um, reduction of all these different contaminants in the oil and controlling the uh, formation of free fatty acids so that the oil that is produced at the end of the process um, has a higher value. From the refinery, we have uh, these um, uh, co compounds called 3MCPD and GE um, that are uh, essentially toxic compounds, and um, there's a limit on the, the uh, concentration of these compounds in the final product. So there are process parameters that we can control to reduce the formation of these compounds. They are formed at high temperature um, and in the presence of uh, chloride ions. So uh, one, one way in which this is mitigated is to wash the CPO before refining. Uh, but there are actually mild refining parameters that are used to also minimize uh, the formation of some of these products. Let me talk a bit about um, the, or finish off by talking a bit about um, trying to implement the circular bioeconomy, right? So, you know, the, currently the, the biggest rate limiting step is the cost of, of deploying that technology. Um, it requires very heavy investments and lengthy uh, developmental time frame towards uh, commercial readiness. We've tested many different uh, platforms and so far none appear to be uh, commercially exciting, let's say, right? And I hope that the, the universities uh, would innovate and come out with maybe better ways of, of doing this at a, low, uh, at a smaller scale uh, to minimize the, the cost footprint. However, having said that, there are solutions within re reach such as a zero discharge mill, uh, as well as refinery with regards to the effluent treatment. So there are different platform technologies that are being developed and are being commercially deployed at the moment that um, essentially uh, completely circularizes the, the, the water, right? So all the water that is uh, used can be reused again. As I mentioned earlier, using digit, uh, digitization and, and also um, um, what do you call it, virtual, um, uh, using uh, mathematical modeling and stuff like that, you're able to actually ensure that your mills uh, can run efficiently, as efficiently as they can. Um, from the plantation standpoint, using uh, fully or semi-autonomous systems um, for fertilizer uh, application, pesticide application, as well as harvesting and bunch evacuation. All of this definitely would rely on 
talented people, right? So we need to upgrade talent and skills of our plantation workers so that they are uh, more compatible to the IR4 uh, skill sets that are required in the industry. Then as mentioned uh, in, in uh, earlier slide, utilization of biomass for bio-based products. So at the moment, um, still not quite there. Uh, CO2 sequestration from flue gas via algae farming, that is possible to do. Um, some of these uh, options may become commercially viable depending on whether a carbon tax is, is imposed or not. Um, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hari Krishna. Uh, let us open to the uh, part, member of the floor. You have any questions? It's very good talk though. Uh, some information is uh, that is very useful for us. So, uh, Dr. Chan, Prof. Chan, yep. do you have any yep. questions? Please go ahead. Hi, Harry. Uh, good to see Hi. you. <laughs> Yeah, I just just a very simple question so because you talk about improving the OER. So it's exciting to see, you know, there's this uh, increase uh, of OER by using uh, enzyme. Yeah, even though it's, it's small, but I think, you know, because considering the volume is huge, huh, so the 0.7% uh, do uh, mean a lot. So my, my question is, uh, what is actually a theoretical uh, OER that we can achieve? Yeah, some say what, 27, some say 34, you know, some say 30. So uh, based on your experience, right, I mean, I guess it's something to do maybe with a lot of factors, but do you know at least, you know, uh, uh, in your meal, right, in, in, in Sun Derby, what, what, what is actually a theoretical OER that we can achieve? Uh, that's a very good question, a very difficult question for me to answer. Um, because uh, doing it at at uh, at lab scale, lab scale doesn't doesn't translate to the industrial scale, right? So in the lab, we managed to get somewhere between two to four percent extra. Okay, but you know you have to take it with a pinch of salt because the measurement may not be absolutely accurate. Lah. So you have to give some some discount factor, right? Um, at the at the at the mill, I believe that we uh, we would be able to get maybe one percent extra at industrial scale, right? So that 0 0.7, you know, um, maybe we can get 0 0.8, but then there's still that 0 0.2. But you know, going for for that um, the last bit of of extra oil requires mo most probably a lot more investment. So then then the question would be, is it worth it? Right. Uh, definitely, from a planting material standpoint, the planting materials contain more oil. The, the new planting materials contain more oil, so the the extraction rate would be improving. Right. Um, this the use of enzymes is essentially to reduce the amount of wastage that ends up in the effluent pond. I think you know in the pomi pond you will see that there's a, a layer of oil, actually sometimes quite a large layer of oil in the effluent pond, right? And that was most probably coming from the unbroken cells that, that end up in the effluent pond. So we are, we are just uh, reducing that, that the losses that are going into the, the effluent pond. So some people ask me, where does the oil come from? So really, we've done quite a lot of work on this. And the oil comes from the solid phase, in the, um, which is not surprising, actually. I mean, that's yeah. where you expect it to come from. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think I've really answered your question adequately, but it's the best I can do at the moment. All right, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, and thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof Chan. A very good uh, answer by Dr. Hari Krishna. Any other questions? Let me look at the uh, chat box. Okay, there's uh, no further questions. Uh, maybe as uh, usual, Dr. Hari Krishna, if you can leave your email, right? Uh, those people who have further questions can email you and then you may uh, respond to their emails. Thank you, Dr. Hari Krishna, for uh, your time, right? okay? So let us, uh, thanks again to Dr. Hari Krishna, and then we move to our next speaker, okay? Okay, now uh, we move to our invited speaker. So we previously had three uh, keynote speakers, 
now we have a few uh, invited speaker and speaker. So our invited speaker here, we have Dr. Li Yi Ying from School of Science, right, Monash Universities. Uh, uh, she will be sharing with us the topic entitled The Role of Fractionations Approach in Concentrating Pump-Based Poly Phytonutrients. So let me uh, introduce, briefly introduce Dr. Lau. Dr. Lau Yi Ying received her PhD degree in food biotech and BSc degree in biotech from University of Putra, Malaysia. She is a lecturer with the Food Science and Technology Discipline in the School of Science for National Universities. She taught undergraduates courses in functional food and fundamental of food and sensory science. Sorry for the noise. We have having constructions here. Her research interests revolve around the area of fat and oil modification, focusing on improving their functional properties. She has received Best PhD Award from the Institute of Bioscience, University of Putra, Malaysia in 2016, and Best Young Researcher Award from Asian Congress on Biotechnology in 2015 for her work, her PhD work on synthesis of structure, lipid, medium, and long chain triglycerol. She has co authored more than five book chapters published more than 20 peer-reviewed articles. She also the lead editor of recent advances in edible fat and oil technology, Springer Nature Books. So without uh, delay, let us uh, invite Dr. Lee. Right. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for the kind introduction. Um, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Very clear and yeah, nice. All right. All right, thanks, and a very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pushpa, and also the organizing committee for the invitations um, to share um, with you um, the research findings from our um, group. Yep, so today I'm going to talk about um, part of my um, research work um, from our research team on the role of fractionation in uh, concentrating phytonutrients from palm sources. So this is the outline for the presentation. So we'll start with the um, phytonutrients, talk about um, common phytonutrients in palm, and then move on to the recent approaches that um, the industry is using um, to concentrate the phytonutrients. And then I'll move on to um, fractionation, which are commonly being used to uh, produce the olein and stearine in um, fats and oil industry. But now I'm looking into how we can apply this uh, fractionations approach to um, concentrate these uh, phytonutrients. And last but not least, I'm going to cover up these presentations by sharing with you um, the um, uh, these uh, fractionations approach, dry and also solvent fractionations methods that we have been used um, to concentrate phytonutrients in um, different types of palm sources. Yep. So I think that um, we are always told to consume um, lots of fruits and vegetables. It helps us to stay healthy and also to stay young. One of the reasons because they are high in uh, antioxidants. Yep. And uh, vitamin E and carotenoids are a few examples of these uh, and compounds that possess these antioxidative properties. And if you can see those pictures on the left, like sunflower seeds, the almond, avocado, spinach, and also broccoli. These are foods that are high in vitamin E. And those on the left with red and orangey color like tomato, um, carrots, pumpkin, and also uh, sweet potato as well as grape fruits, uh, they are the ones that are rich in um, carotenoids. Yeah. But um, in our palm fruitlets itself, they are also considered as a very uh, valuable um, compound because not only that they are rich in uh, phytonutrients like carotenoids and vitamin E, but they also have a variety of these phytonutrients like scoline um, um, and coenzyme Q10, so on and so forth. And today, um, the presentations will be focusing on carotenoids and also the vitamin E. And these are the two things that we have been actually concentrating in our research work. So if you take a look at carotenoids in palm, it's wonderful to see that 
these uh, palm basically is the richest source of um, natural plant source of carotenoids in terms of the retinol equivalent. And uh, red palm oil itself contains 50 times more of retinol equivalents compared to carrots, 300 times more than tomato, four and 44 times more than the leafy vegetables. So it's pretty high if you call mainly is um, if you want to look at plant sources of carotenoids, they are pretty very high for uh, these palm fruitlets itself. And um, those isomers in for carotenoids, if it is from palm, it mainly comes from um, this um, beta carotene. So we have a few different types of isomers of carotene. And the main one that we can get from palm will be the beta carotene. Yep. And uh, for vitamin E, I think that in the first day itself, Dr. Badaria also mentions a little bit about vitamin E can exist in two different forms, tocopherols and tocotrienol. The difference between them is in terms of their degree of unsaturations. If you can see for tocotrienol, they are unsaturated. They have unsaturated till, but tocopherols, they are basically saturated. And um, the unique thing about vitamin E that we have in palm is that they are rich in this uh, tocotrienol as compared to other types of vegetable oil, whereby tocopherol is, um, is high. Yep. So which is why we can say that it's considered as this uh, tocotrienol rich fraction. Yep. So we can see from the table, mainly not only, uh, only two types of oil that are rich in um, tocotrienol, uh, one is the palm itself, and the other one is the rice bran oil. So it's pretty very, uh, it is not so um, easy to get these chocotrienols in oil, except the palm and also the rice bran. Yep. So since they are relatively valuable, these phytonutrients, what industry is trying to do is that they try to actually um, concentrate, to extract, isolate, and even to purify these phytonutrients. And if you can see from the picture here, these are the instruments that the industry are usually uh, practicing to isolate out these um, phytonutrients, short path molecular distillations, and also the supercritical fluid extractions. So in short path molecular distillations, I think in uh, first day, I think Prof Chang has mentioned that you can actually convert the um, acyglycerols into the metal ester and then um, separate out the phytonutrients from the oil. Yep. And this kind of the um, extractions process is pretty very efficient, I would say. And it also produces a very high purities of phytonutrients and they are also very green. But the thing is that this instrument is basically very costly and it's relatively difficult for those small industry to adopt yep, or to invest in this kind of instrument. And what make us, uh, and this actually give us this idea, why not try to utilize the processings that we have in the fat and, fats and oils industry, which is the fractionation and try to use it to um, concentrate these um, phytonutrients. Basically, we are adding in extra additional line from the fractionations process um, to concentrate these uh, phytonutrients. Yep. And the reason why we choose fractionations is because it is well established in the fats and oils industry already. So yeah, so it's pretty much easy for the industry to um, adopt these um, methods. Yeah. So a um, little bit about fractionations is whereby uh, process is a type of process that we use to separate the uh, high melting fraction and also the low melting fractions of the oil uh, into the sterine and also the um, olein uh, counterpart. So sterine will consist of high melting fat. So usually they'll be used to make like a hard stock for margarine, uh, coca butter alternative, and even ghee. And for olein itself, that uh, they are very liquid. Uh, they are liquid in nature. So usually those vegetables oil that we uh, sell in the market is actually considered as the olein, right? So they are used as cooking oil and also the um, salad oil. Yeah. And this is basically 
basically a simple process of how fractionations can be carried out. It's pretty very simple. We have the oil, we preheat them to remove all the crystals memory of the oil. Then we cool it down so that nucle nucleus can uh, um, form. And once the nucleus of the oil is formed, it will allow the formations of crystals. Yep, so those formations of crystals belongs to the high uh, melting fat. And it will hold it uh, for the crystals to grow. And then uh, subsequently, we'll then filter them and we'll get this um, solid part and also the liquid part. Yeah, so um, basically for fractionations, it can be carried out via three different approaches, detergent frac, uh, dry fractionations, and also the um, solvent fractionation. Um, so detergents will involve incorporations of uh, detergent. It's not so commonly being used today in the industry, but for dry and solvent frac, um, they are uh, used in the industry. Yeah, so dry frac basically does not involve any additions of um, any additive, but for solvent frac, they involve the use of um, solvent. Yeah, so if you'd like to know more about fractionations for palm oil, how these uh, processings of um, uh, fractionations processing, how it will influence these uh, palm oil fractionations, you can um, go through our papers that has been published in uh, European journals of lipid science and technology. Yeah. And uh, what we did is that we actually tried different, two different approaches to concentrate this phytonutrient. Uh, one of them is the dry fractionation approach to concentrate vitamin E from um, a feedstock known as the um, palm fatty acid distillate. So that is this uh, kind of like a byproducts that has been uh, produced or collected during this uh, deodorization process. And it has remarkably high uh, vitamin E content. So we actually use that and to um, make an attempt to see whether dry fractionations can be used to concentrate this um, vitamin E from that feedstock. Yeah. And um, we, what we do is that, what we did is that we try out a few different kinds of processing parameters, mainly the dry fractionations processing parameters like um, crystallization temperature, stirring speed, the rate of crystallizations, and also the holding time uh, to see uh, the effects in concentrating this um, vitamin E. And what we found from a study is that um, it's quite um, interesting because we found that in most all of these conditions that we apply, uh, these vitamin E actually tend to concentrate in the oil in fractions, which is the liquid fraction. Yeah. So as compared to the stirring fraction, and it's also well correlated to the high degree of unsaturation. Yeah. And um, in this study, we managed to actually concentrate like um, 1005 ppm of vitamin E in the oil in fraction as compared to the orig original PFAD itself, yep, uh, that contain um, 1, uh, three, around 1,300 ppm of this vitamin E. Yep. So I would say that these um, concentrations would be slightly low. Yep. And uh, even though that the process is green because it does not involve any solvent, yep. so the um, concentration is very low. And not only that, one of the downside of this approach is that we get a very low yield of olein because here we wanted to get olein because olein, uh, because vitamin E tend to concentrate in olein. But what we get is that um, we get only like 50 grams of olein out of these 500 grams of PFAD that we uh, fractionate. Yeah. And this work is actually. Uh, been done by uh, my uh, master student Annie. Yeah, so uh, we're trying to actually improve further um, to use a solvent fractionation to concentrate yeah carotino carotenoids. So what we wanted to see is that since dry fractionations is not so efficient, which uh, lead us to have a very low yield and also very low concentrations of vitamin E. So why not we try on another approach using a solvent, which is much more effective um, to separate 
uh, or to separate the ovin and also the stirring. And we did the same thing to look at these uh, different types of solvent fractionations conditions, like uh, how the um, different types of solvents, agitation, crystallizations time, uh, oil to solvent ratios, crystallizations temperature, and also the seedling agents, how it will influence, 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 influence of these carotenoids in this olein fraction. So we start off with uh, CPO, because CPO contain a very high carotenoids content. We heat it to remove crystals memory. We then cool them down to initiate nucleus um, formations and let it grow, hold it, let the crystals to grow. And then lastly, we- um, uh, Dr. Lee, sorry, you have another five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah and we separate them into olein and also the stirring fractions. And we actually did uh, two rounds of fractionations. Yep. So in the first round of fractionations, what we get is that this is the best conditions that we have. And we actually managed to get to concentrate around 8.4% um, of this um, carotenoids in this olein fraction. And uh, we try to improve further to concentrate this um, carotenoids in the olein. So what we did is that we did a second round of fractionations from this olein that we get from the first break. And in fact, we can see a very drastic increase in this uh, carotenoids concentrations. It actually increases to 27%. Yep. And the olein yield that we get is around 30% as compared to the dry fractionations, which is pretty low. And we actually wanted to see, uh, we tested that on carotenoids and also vitamin E, and we wanted to actually um, see whether this approach can be used to concentrate other phytonutrients from palm sources or not. Yep. So we, uh, what we did is that we do a computational simulation work uh, on this, and we found that those phytonutrients from the palm sources they actually has a very high binding affinities to the olein fraction, which means that they will tend to um, um, go to this um, olein fraction. Yep, and this is the work that is done by um, my uh, honor students, uh, Shi Cheng. Yep, so yeah. So, um, so I'd like to wrap up this, that uh, we are actually blessed to have palm fruitlets because as compared to other vegetables, oils, they are a rich source of phytonutrients. And there are a lot of phytonutrients that we can actually extract from these uh, fruitlets beside the vitamin E and carotenoids. So uh, it's actually a very good potential uh, areas, right, uh, for us to work to create value added products for to this uh, oil palm industry. Yeah, and um, fractionations can basically be used as an economical approach. Even though fractionations can be used to separate olein and stirring, it can also it has also the potentials to concentrate uh, on this um, carotenoids and also the um, uh, vitamin E. So why not we uh, um, try to use those existing processing that we have in the fats and oil industry and try to apply it to concentrate these uh, phytonutrients? Yeah. So I think yeah. So um, I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators in Monash and also those external very good collaborators outside of Monash for their uh, support uh, to um, carry out the uh, research work. And I think you know who you are. And um, yeah, so this is the only part of our research work. We're also working on structured lipids and also um, nanocellulose. So um, if you have any interest in um, this kind of things, you can just uh, drop me a line. We are open for collaboration. Yep, so uh, thank you. That's all for my presentation. Yep, over to you, uh, Dr. John. Hello, thank you, Dr. Lee. Very interesting talk on the nutrients. So many things I learned in these uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, any question from the floor? Uh, Prof Chan, yes, go ahead. Ying, uh, just a simple question. Uh. Mm. So why, why does the phytonutrients have the affinity towards uh, the palm story? I, I, I'm not sure whether you've uh, yeah, mentioned this. Maybe I didn't get it. Oh, yeah. So, so those phytonutrients, if you can see, they are pretty, like, for example, vitamin E, they have, like, 
uh, um, unsaturations. Yep, these, those uh, uh, teals with unsaturated. Yep, so, so it's kind of like light to light, a row of light to light uh, uh, dissolvability that, which is why they can dissolve in the olein. Olein is high in unsaturated uh, fatty acid. So if you have those phytonutrients, so those phytonutrients will tend to uh, bind to those um, olein, yeah, because of high degrees of unsaturations of that instead of the um, stirring counterpart. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I see that uh, there's no other questions. Uh, okay. Thanks again, Dr. Lee, for a very uh, interesting talk on the uh, phytonutrients. So let's just move to uh, our next speaker, Dr. Tu Yin Yin. Dr. Tu Yin Yin will share with us a uh, 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 title and dye pump polyn based uh, allo gel as a bioactive delivery system. So Dr. Tu Yin Yin is from School of Science, Monash University, Malaysia. Let me read uh, briefly about her biography. Dr. Tu Yin Yin worked in the School of Science at Monash University, Malaysia as a senior lecturer. She interested in alternative methods for preserving and processing food. Her research team utilized oleo gelations as an alternative processing method to structures lipid oil and use the structures oil as a bioactive compound delivery vehicles in food matrix. Another primary area of her work is to fight food waste by developing biodegradable food packaging film using food waste. She published numerous journals in the area of natural products, influence of processing on antioxidant activity, as well as micro-encapsulation and control release. She had completed supervision of more than 10 honours and third-year project students and currently have a group of three HDR students. Let's just uh, welcome Dr. Tu. So Dr. Yeah. Tu, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, we thank can you. Slide. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Dr. John. Yeah, for the kind introductions. Yeah, hope you can hear me clear. <laughs> yeah, it's very clear, Dr. Tu. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, the organizer. Yeah, uh, Prof. Uh, as well as uh, Dr. Kushpal and the organizer uh, for inviting me for this today's talk. So uh, today's presentation is the sharing of my uh, students, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Gan Xie Yi, yeah, of her PhD works. Uh. So it's in regards to the use of oleo, uh, palm olin to form oleo gel. And today we are just uh, sharing of one specific, uh, specific part on using oleo gel as a bioactive delivery. So let me start with the introduction of what is oleo gel. So oleo gel is a semi-solid system. So it comprises mostly of this um, liquid or uh, liquid which is mainly of lipid phase. And with these uh, oleo gelations, what happens is that we transform the liquid oil into a semi-solid, as you can see in this picture. So in order for it to actually to transform from liquid to semi-solid phase, we require oleo gelator. Or a lot of times we are using this uh, or plant waxes or some uh, emulsifier or surfactants. Yeah, so it very, very much depends on the type of gelator, the oleo gelator that we add on, because this oleo gelator is the one that uh, helps to form the network to entrap the oil. No, and, and, yeah, entrap the oil, which is the liquid element. And this whole process involves mostly just the physical. Uh, interactions without uh, altering the uh, chemical characteristics. In other words, it will not actually cause uh, the oil to turn rancid. And to form this gel, typically there are two methods. One is solid fiber and the second is fluid filled fiber. So the main difference between these two methods are the, the former, the solid fiber is without using the water, whereas the later, the fluid filled fiber involve water. So today's uh, sharing, I will be actually sharing on this um, oleo gel that involves water so that it can use to deliver both the um, lipophilic as well as hydrophilic uh, compounds. Yeah. So nowadays, uh, uh, people are much more health conscious. We are constantly looking for a healthier choice. So therefore, here comes this, this oleo gel. Yeah. 
So people have been actually uh, looking into this oil gel and looking at it as an alternative or the substitute to these saturated and hydrogenated fats. And man, many studies have completed where they uh, use this oil gel as a fat substitute in the sausages, meat patty, as well as cake baking, either as a full uh, substitutions or a partial. And a lot of them actually is um, works well. And even they have done some sensory testing and people actually uh, like it. Although some of them, they, they find some different, but it's still acceptable. So in a way that, yeah, therefore industry also actually looking at it as one of the alternative. Yeah, another application of oil gel, which I'm going to discuss further, is on the use of it as an encapsulations or the delivery of biotic compounds. Besides actually using as a vehicle to deliver biotic compounds, it also acts as a protector, yeah, as a, as a protection to these uh, biotic compounds from degradations, as well as help, uh, help with the control release. So in a way that we would be able targeting to actually improve the overall bioavailability. Yeah. So bioactive compounds uh, has been an interest of a lot of people, consumers, industry, as well as researchers. And yeah, we know that because biotic compounds provide us a lot of health benefits, be good for us. Yeah, it, I mean, uh, our youth, I mean, uh, skin care and a lot of others, like the one that uh, Dr. Lee have shared, or the Lee Ying, like tocopherol, all this. Yeah. So, but the, a lot of times these biotic compounds have their uh, challenges themselves. First is that a lot of them actually have low bioavailability, especially those of uh, lipophilic compounds. They are poorly uh, dissolved in aqueous uh, environment, and especially in the digestive tract, a lot of the enzymes, they are aqueous based. So which means that it may not be able to dissolve and, and, and therefore it makes it a barrier for this bioavailability. And next, these uh, uh, biotic compounds, many of them, they are sensitive to environment. Yeah. Especially these, uh, like those digestive juice that have acids, bases, base or enzymes that would cause a degradation before it reached the small intestine for absorptions. And lastly, even if we actually make into the pill, like a supplements or for putting into the lotion for skincare products, a lot of times they may be actually a sensitive to the environmental factor like the light, the heat, and making them actually to degrade before our uh, before usage. So therefore, it is of a constant uh, needs for us to identify a cost-effective methods to act as a delivery system for these biotic compounds, either in the food system or for a uh, pharmaceutical uh, per se. So. For this uh, today sharing, I will actually share two models which uses uh, curcumin as a lipophilic model and ascorbic acids as a uh, hydrophilic model. Both of these have uh, common uh, uh, challenges where they are actually poor solubility as well as uh, low bioavailability. When we, I mentioned poor solubility, which means that curcumin has poor solubility in water. Yeah. We know that it's good easier to dissolve in uh, oil, but not water. And vice versa for these ascorbic acids. So now, uh, my, my question would, my research question would be actually whether or not this oil gel can be a good party com uh, delivery system for both uh, lipid as well as water soluble. Yeah, because this oil gel that I found consists of uh, water, which is actually made using the fluid field fiber. And second is to look into whether this 3D matrix able to actually, or how well it would be able to control the release of these uh, curcumin as well as ascorbic acids. Yeah, so, and here leads to this objective of my, uh, this student's work, which is to see, to investigate the effect of these hydrophilic as well as lipophilic compounds on the oxidative stability of the palm olin base oil gel. And followed by that is to look into this uh, in vitro digestion of these palm olin based oil gel 
that has been fortified with uh, curcumin as well as ascorbic acids. So as I mentioned, uh, the oil gel that form uses uh, the fluid field fiber. So it has water in the mixture. So in order to actually prepare this uh, fortified um, oil gel, so we have to use a different method in a way that curcumin gel have to actually have its curcumin to be added into the palm oil. In. Whereas this ascorbic acid gel, which I call it here as a gel, we dissolve these ascorbic acids in the water phase. Yeah. So then we actually uh, subject it for storage study for 30 days. And then we look, analyze it for every two weeks. Uh. And then we uh, analyze for its antioxidant activity as well as the oxidative analysis. Because we want to see how well this oil gel would be able to uh, carry or to protect these antioxidants in terms of quantity. And then next is to see how well would it be able to protect the oil. And the next phase is to look into in, red, in vitro analysis. It's like uh, whether or not this oil gel would be able to actually help us to improve the overall bioavailability in a way that it control release where hopefully that it could delay this digestion so that we have sufficient amount that is available in the small intestine for uh, absorptions. So yeah, without further ado, uh, let me go into the findings. Yeah, so the, the front part of the first phase is on storage stability. So here I share with you on these uh, uh, biotic compounds that we quantify using HPLC. So I mentioned just now in the protocol, I added 500 milligram per kg of ascorbic acids as well as curcumin into this oil gel. Unfortunately, what I realized that we realized that 65% uh, of ascorbic acids lost during the preparation because in war heat. Whereas curcumin, yeah, many of them retain. So across the storage, then there is uh, these reductions. And looking at it, oil gel, which are mostly of oil, it able to entrap this curcumin very well. And it can really protect this curcumin very well. But not so much for these um, ascorbic acids. And then we look into the activity. So we know it's the amount left here. So, how about the activity? Whether it's actually tally? Yeah, the answer is actually it matches. Yeah, in a way that uh, the highest antioxidant activity is curcumin gel, CC gel, followed by AA gel, PO gel, and PO. Yeah, PO is the, uh, just a liquid oil without anything. So we can see that although there is antioxidant scavenging capacity, which uh, could be contributed by the uh, tocotrienol or the vitamin E that present or beta carotene that present within the oil. Yeah. So <clears throat> in the pure gel, which actually consists of the soil lecithins, yeah, surprisingly, it actually happens to actually uh, be like about threefold of this PO. So we actually uh, relate it to this, uh, the synergistic effect interaction between these, um, the soil acetins and the tocopherol, which eventually improve this uh, overall antioxidant capacity. So this is for this uh, APKS. Similarly, we also actually did for DPPH and we observed the same trend for uh, APKS and uh, DPPH. So what we could summarize is that yeah, antioxidant activity of these um, curcumins is higher than ascorbic AA gel. So this oil gel network could really actually protect, yeah, it's a better, offer better protections to lipophilic compounds, not so much for these as hydrophilic compounds. And next we look into which lipophilic or this hydrophilic uh, compound would be better, uh, provide better protections to the oil itself. So therefore we had conducted the peroxide value as well as P and acidins. So yeah, we have done the study and then we realized that actually these are both the CC gel and AA gel actually met this uh, codex standard in a way that across the storage, even at the end of the period, these uh, PV is still within this uh, range, I mean, below 10. So it's acceptable. And it shows that this uh, presence of these ascorbic acids and curcumin able to actually uh, influence the formations of these primary oxidation products 
and where it slowed down. So if we to compare these uh, CC gel and the AA gel, yeah, it's, it's much far lower as compared to the PO value. The highest here is the PO. So it's actually, it did actually slow down because of the metric, the 3D metrics. And then we have done this uh, PNSidine value as well. So we can see that yeah, oil gel could really actually helps to reduce this oil mobility, uh, eventually also uh, slow down this, uh, the movements of these uh, peroxides or these reticles and slow down the oxidations. So when we compare between these curcumins and these uh, AA gel, what we realize is that AA gel, although it has a lower antioxidant activity, but surprisingly, it able to protect the, the oil better than the curcumin. So it doesn't matter, I mean, although it has lesser quantity, but the protection that it offers is somehow better than the uh, curcumin gel. So, and we actually relate this to this uh, para, uh, polar paradox theory, where hydrophilic antioxidants are more effective in bulk oil systems. So is the reason being is that the peroxyl uh, reticles that present are usually in the water lipid phase or the water phase. So which means that ascorbic acids would present in this range, this uh, aqueous phase, where you can't actually get the curcumin to be in there. So, <clears throat> so in order to actually identify the suitable antioxidants in this multi-phase system, so we have to really carefully look into the polarity of it. And the next phase is uh, on the in vitro analysis. <clears throat> so if we, and then like uh, for this study, we have uh, two main samples, which are the oil gel, and then uh, have the control, which is mainly of oil only, that we add uh, ascorbic acids and curcumin directly into the oil. So what you realize is that oil gels have a higher stability than oil samples. So where you can see in the first two hours, uh, the mass, of this uh, gel remains, uh, it did not actually reduce, it's constant. So, and the release of these uh, ascorbic acids as well as curcumin is slower in oil gel yeah, as compared to bulk oil. Yeah, it because relates to this uh, 3D structure of it. And this slow release is uh, desirable. Its main reason is because it could actually delay the release so that we can have sufficient amount of deep biotic compounds, the curcumin or the ascorbic acids to actually arrive in the small intestine for uh, absorptions. Then the next thing we have been asking is that, so we have AA gel and CC gel. So which has a higher or a better release when it comes to higher uh, bioaccessibility? The answer is uh, what we realized from the finding is actually AA gel because AA gel, it has a poor solubility in the palm oil. So, so that the binding of it in the structure will be actually poorer. So when you reach the small intestine, it's easier to be released. So therefore you could actually see that uh, the release amount of these uh, <clears throat> AA gel, the ascorbic acids from the gel would be actually uh, uh, higher than the CC gel. And a tight bound biotic compounds yeah, because of the tidal uh, binding would result in a longer prolonged release uh, profile. So in a nutshell, uh, this oil gel provide a very good protections to this curcumin. Yeah, it can really uh, extend it to until this um, small uh, intestine. Yeah. So in summary, what we could actually summarize that the, the oil gel, the palm oil in oil gel that we actually prepare in the lab could delay the oil oxidations. And it protect yeah, the oil gel from the oxidations, especially the ascorbic acids yeah, because of this uh, polar paradox theory. And the bioaccessibility of the biotic compounds is influenced by the uh, solubility or the polarity where we have this AA with a polar or uh, lower solubility in oil gel happens to be a have a higher bioaccessibility. So what we realize uh, from this uh, finding is that oil gel could be a good alternative uh, delivery system for this uh, lipophilic as well as hydrophilic. Yeah. 
in order for us to improve the bioavailability because of the metrics that it has. So in future, we may actually make this olive gel into a spread yeah, for it to actually carry these, uh, some of these uh, nutrients and then is for um, to make a healthier options for the consumers. Yeah. So these are the references that uh, I use in these presentations. Yeah. So this um, project is supported by FIGS as well as School of Science. But nevertheless, I also would like to thank the collaborators that are involved in this study. Yeah, thank you very much. Hope I retain the time. Thank you, Dr. Tu. Very uh, good uh, timekeeping. And <laughs> okay, so uh, any question from a member of the floor? You want to ask about oleo gel? So something new to me as well, even it had been there for 20 years. Uh, for myself, I always play with the aerogel. So audio gel something is a thing uh, very interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Prof Chan, do you have anything to ask? It's me again. Yeah. Uh, so again, thank you for your presentation. Learn something from you today. So uh, just to recap, uh, uh, is what, what is the formulation of your audio gel now? Oh, oil gel. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you make I have, oil? I have actually both. One is actually with oil. One is without. Oh no, sorry, not without. With, one with water. One with water, and one is without. Uh, water. Yeah, the one that I presented today is the one with water. So that because if I to actually to formulate something like a spread, right? So impossible. I use a full oil. <laughs> then it will be high fat. So therefore, um. Uh, we have to actually look into to incorporate some water inside so we can actually have a, a healthier options. So, so can I say it's like a water in oil emulsion? I can. This yeah. oil gel is like water in, water in oil emulsion. Uh, I um, guess it contains a lot of oil, very little amount of water. This one I actually have. What, what is the fractions of uh, the, the uh, oil and water? So now for this one is 42% of oil. 40, so, so, okay. So, 42% water oil. and uh, the remaining, 42% is oil, remaining water. About 30, 40, about 20, 20% 20 of water. Okay, so what are the remaining? Is uh, some kind of the gelators. The gelators. Mm. So, so, what do you use in this case? Uh, soil lecithin and also the GMS. Uh, it's mainly like uh, those emulsifiers to help to make this emulsion. All right, so it's like a thickening kind of uh, agent or something uh, to thicken and uh, to bind these two not the, really the oil thicken. and water together. Although gelation, it will actually, uh, this gelator is like starting like a nuclei in the oil. So okay. because we first have to dissolve them. So once we actually uh, reduce the temperature, I mean, so go to the room temperature and this uh, soil acetin, all this like a nucleus, so they will actually start to cause the oil to like uh, crystallize, aggregate together. Okay. So because of these aggregations, these are uh, things that come together and then they'll entrap the oil inside. So, so, so Molly, I'm just trying to imagine molecularly how, how it looks like. Yeah. So where is your water and where is your oil and also the gelator? Okay, so maybe I can actually show you the, the picture of it. Uh. So this is actually more of the gelator and then the water, the oil will be actually surrounding it, lah, the outside. So yeah, you see the crystals. Have you, have you captured, uh, for example, uh, microscopy you know, images yes. to identify yes. you know, where your water is and, and stuff like that? Mm, yeah, we have actually uh, completed. Lah. So the yeah. students actually have done that as well. So these crystals, you can have a, like a crystal, sometimes have needle, fibril. It depends on the type of polygelator. And then we will have, we will see all the liquid. Lah. But because uh, for the liquid, we can't differentiate uh, whether it's a water or oil. <laughs> Maybe you have to make some colors to it. Or we something. probably do have to do some staining. Uh. staining so because like, it's interesting, yeah. you choose a different two different model. Uh, mm. The active compound one is a water soluble and the other one is oil soluble. Right? Yeah. So yeah. ascorbic acid, I assume you know, it will actually go into the, the encapsulated in the water phase. Yes. The curcumin is in the oil phase. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think you know um, that, that is that why. Would, 
Yeah, that, that will play a role on uh, how your formulation will impact, mm. let's say, the stability you know, of your compound and mm. also the delivery of the compound. Yeah. Very interesting work. I think I, mm. probably we can talk about this uh, some other time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Okay, thank you, Prof. Chance. Uh, very interesting. Uh, please uh, put down your email as well, Dr. Hu. And thank you again. So we move to our next speakers. Also, our last speaker, they have received that the uh, speakers is not free, and then we have been have been replaced by a, another speaker. Okay, uh, Doctor Ho Bun Ching uh, is not free today. Okay, not available, but we have a very another very good speaker. All right, also my good friend, huh? Okay, <laughs> hey, <join>. uh, <laughs> Professor Doctor Edward. Hui Ching Wei, right? Uh, to represent Dr. Hao. So, Dr. Edward, uh, are you presenting the same title? Yes, I'm presenting the same okay. uh, topic. So, uh, uh, yes. So, so, Dr. Edward, uh, who will be presenting the topic and title Recovery of Palm Carotene from Palm Oil Derivatives Using a Liquid Anti Solvent Precipitation. Uh, Social Professor Dr. Edward also from School of Engineering, Monash Universities. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, his uh, biography. Uh, you can Google his name. Uh, he's well known in this area. Okay. Uh, the, so, uh, without further delay, uh, I'd like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Ui to present uh, his, uh, his uh, topics. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chuan. Um, uh, before that, can I confirm that you are seeing my full screen? Yeah, it's a full screen and your mind is clear. Okay, thanks. So, a very good afternoon to all of the uh, participants here. And I would like to thank the organizer for inviting uh, our members uh, from these groups, uh, including Dr. Ha uh, Ho, uh, who is the principal investigator of these projects. Uh, he used to be my... Uh, with PhD students working on the extractions of the carotenes from palm oil. And in the past symposiums, uh, we have already covered uh, some of our prelim works uh, on the liquid anti solvent precipitations as a novel method to extract palm carotenes. And today, uh, we would like to share more information on the potential of these methods uh, for the extractions of uh, carotene from different sources of the palm oil. And these times, uh, we would like to focus more on the sludge palm oil as another type of the promising source of the carotenes. So uh, I believe the, uh, you have been hearing these uh, phytochemicals uh, from palm oil from the previous speakers, uh, including Dr. Uh, Lee. And uh, I'll be covering briefly on the carotenes uh, because you know that it's the antioxidants that can be found easily from the palm oil sources. And uh, not only that, uh, there are other type of the fruits and foods uh, containing this high amount of the carotenes. And the two types of the carotenes are the xanthophils and carotenes. They differ uh, in terms of the presence of uh, absence of these oxygens in their structures. But uh, today, we'll be mo mostly focusing on the carotenes. And in terms of the applications, uh, we have uh, been well known about uh, its usage in food formulations or other kind of the uh, potential users in the nutraceutical fields and medical fields. And this is also, uh, uh, it has been covered by Dr. Lee uh, about the potential benefits. Uh, I just want to highlight the global markets of the carotenes. It is growing strong and uh, it's definitely a, a good uh, market to penetrate. Let's say we are targeting the extractions of the carotenes from the natural resources. So uh, as you know, Malaysia is well known for uh, as the uh, one of the major producer of palm oil globally. And this diagram uh, shows a uh, simple palm oil processing uh, units. And typically, we know that palm oil is rich in antioxidants and phytochemicals uh, in these crude states, which is the crude palm oil. And uh, in particularly, I just want to highlight that it has the highest concentration of the carotenoids of any plant oils. So 
Um, during the processing, so we either will get the refined oil as a cooking oil, or either we will also turn it into other renewables with our sources like the biodiesel. But these kind of uh, processes uh, could actually degrade uh, the concentration of the carotenes uh, uh, during these kind of the harsh processing units. Um, but I just want to stress that uh, aside from the very original crude palm oils, uh, we can also acquire uh, carotenoids from different variants of the oils that we can get from these palm oil processings. So this actually presents uh, opportunities for us to extract carotenoids uh, from this natural source. Uh, Imagine that if we can recover 1% of the carotenoids from the crude palm oil that has not been refined, you know, the values could be very, very huge as stated here. It is a rough estimations. But the challenges here is that uh, how can we uh, prevent the degradations of the carotenoids? And if we can uh, uh, make 1% of that, so surely you can imagine so how uh, profitable is this um, business. So I'm going to look into the aspects of the carotenoid degradations uh, because this is where that uh, you, you will find that uh, most of the times the RBD process like the uh, deodorizations, degummings or bleaching processes, they are very, very harsh uh, by using the acids or this kind of a solvents or bleaching earth or even the high temperature conditions. And uh, what we can be <laughs> we sure is that these uh, conditions, in addition to the light and air exposures, they are not favorable to the retention of the carotenoids after the refining processes. So this is where usually you will not see the orange color of the cooking oils. And uh, also for the biodiesel productions, uh, they mainly use the RBD olins and the process of the transesterification also involve uh, harsh uh, alkaline or acidic uh, transesterification and then subsequently the distillation processes. So uh, these are the challenges that we will face in case we want to extract the carotenes from uh, either the cooking oil or from the uh, biodiesel. So uh, in our studies, uh, we try to explore other uh, alternative feedstocks uh, that could serve as uh, this uh, origins of the palm carotenes, though it's not as uh, promising as the crude palm oil, which is best known as for the highest concentration of the carotenes. Uh, but the usage of uh, derivative like the waste oil uh, from the pomi, which is the sludge palm oil, uh, could be attractive because we could resolve the environmental issue while extracting these uh, valuable compounds from the waste. So sludge palm oil uh, is typically the oil that you can obtain from the pomes and uh, it should be widely available from the millings. And um, if we take this sludge palm oils uh, for the transesterifications into the uh, biodiesel, it could be deemed very challenging because of its uh, high free fatty acids, uh, which is not favorable for the subsequent transesterifications. And uh, if you use the harsher conditions, uh, surely we won't get the palm carotenes, though you may get the right biodiesels. So um, we were inspired by <laughs> these uh, projects uh, driven by the Professor Chan's uh, as well as Dr. Song's groups uh, on the enzymatic transesterifications, which has been proven uh, very mild in the operating conditions uh, by using the lipase, um, the commercial lipase, uh, this, uh, which will be uh, able to preserve the palm carotenes after the productions of this um, fame, the fetal, uh, fame fatty acid methyl ester. So coming back to the methods that we can use to extract the palm carotenes uh, from uh, uh, these publications uh, from the Dr. House, uh, we have already summarized the pro and cons of all these six methods, uh, which has also been slightly mentioned by the previous speakers. So uh, we just want to summarize uh, some of the challenges or the drawbacks uh, of these conventional methods as listed here. Uh, typically, uh, the usage of uh, you know, equipment uh, may demand uh, the space uh, requirements as well as uh, also the consideration of the potential scaling up of the processes. And then uh, solvent consumption is another issue, so, but uh, typically we will still use it 
but uh, we have to be sure that the whatever solvents you use in the processing of the foods uh, must be also be biocompatible or it can be deemed safe for consumptions. And the other issue that we usually encounter in the conventional extraction method is the uh, potential thermal degradations. Uh, let's say if there's an excessive heat consumption or utilizations in the process. So um, in our research, uh, we try to recover the palm carotenes uh, from the palm oil derivative, uh, which I've mentioned, the sludge palm oil. And we have already the basis of uh, forming the biodiesel uh, from this sludge palm oil using the enzymatic transesterifications. So uh, by having that fixed stock, uh, we want to see that whether our methods, the liquid anti-solvent precipitations, uh, will be able to extract the carotenes and while maintaining the quality of this biodiesel at the end so that uh, we won't disrupt its in, uh, original intentions of using the biodiesel as the fuel. Uh, let me briefly explain uh, the concept of this uh, liquid anti-solvent precipitations. Uh, we actually got this idea from uh, the crystallizations of the proteins, uh, which is based on this LAP principles uh, in which the presence of the anti-solvents uh, would actually promote the nucleations as well as the growth of the target compounds in the bulk solutions uh, where it is at the supersaturation state. And this has been widely used uh, in the purification of the proteins or the drugs, materials, or even for the preparations of uh, nanoparticles. But uh, it has less, not, I would say, less explored for extraction purposes. So inspired by this, mechanisms, uh, we have attempted um, these methods in, in the extractions of the carotenes uh, in the presence of the uh, flames, which is the metal esters. And uh, we try to precipitate the sterins in which we call this as a carrier. And then from there, uh, we should be able to collect the solid fractions, which is enriched with these carotenes. So the process itself, uh, in the beginnings, we must uh, homogeneously mix uh, all these stock solutions, uh, including the alcohol, which, which acts as a, a form of the anti-solvent, and the water will be used to adjust the hydrophilicity. And the reason why we uh, prepare all these solutions at 60 degrees is to ensure the homogeneous solution formations in the beginnings. And the subsequent process is very straightforward, as you can see that it involved the stirring and mixings of all these compounds. Um, and then subsequently, we try to cool down the temperature as fast as possible uh, while doing the slow stirrings. And from there, so you should be able to see the formations of the precipitates over the time. And then you decant the solutions, and that's where you will be able to collect the carotenoid-rich uh, precipitates. So this is how straightforward the process. Uh, the below diagram shows uh, there's a one uh, optical images that we have captured. Uh, typically, it's just the staring that we use here as the carriers. And um, before we can start uh, on the uh, final uh, determining the performance, right? Uh, we should be able to run a screen, quick screening, screening test to ensure that uh, we have identified all the governing factors of this uh, extraction process. Um, here we, we will get the transesterified SPO as the source, and then we explore different types of the anti solvents because uh, it, the hydrophilicity of the anti solvents uh, plays a role here. As you can see, um, the right uh, degree of the hydrophilicities, as given by the ethanols, uh, will be uh, good enough to induce uh, the formations of these uh, sterile precipitates. And then the ratio of the solvents to the uh, SPME, which is the metal ester generated from the starch palm oils, uh, can be seen here that uh, we require uh, quite a high uh, portion of the solvents here. But as I mentioned just now, uh, the solvents uh, can be easily recycled and ethanol is deemed to be uh, consumable. And the next thing will be the water percentage. Uh, it has a close relationship to the uh, anti-solvent that we use. So this is just to fine tune the hydrophilicities from there. And then uh, the remaining two uh, operating processes, namely the temperature and the stirring speeds, uh, they do not have uh, much kind of uh, influences to the extraction processes. 
And then the mixing durations, uh, we found that uh, about two hours of these stirrings uh, should be good enough to do promote these precipitation formations. And that's why uh, we brought these three operating parameters to the subsequent uh, optimizations by using the response surface methodologies. Um, by using 20 runs of the experiments uh, developed using this CCD models, uh, we will be able to identify the optimal extraction conditions. As mentioned in here, uh, you can see that uh, the temperature will be slightly lower than the initial uh, determined uh, temperatures, which uh, about 43 degrees Celsius uh, would be good to promote uh, these precipitation formations. And then uh, we also want to prevent the solidification of the- Oh yeah, you have another five minutes, yeah? Oh uh, yes, this is my last two slides. <laughs> so this one, uh, we will be able to uh, promote the uh, precipitation formations without inducing the two phase formations. If the solvent itself is too hydrophobic, uh, we will not be able to get the homogeneous solutions and that's where the precipitates will not be easily formed. And then the right solvents to the uh, fixed stock ratios will also be ensure that uh, the super saturation uh, can occur easily from there. So the water percentage against uh, that will promote uh, the uh, entrapments of the carotenes eventually. So uh, from here, uh, we by using just ten percent of the stearines, uh, this we have fixed it as a constant. We uh, have successfully recovered uh, thirty four point five percent of the uh, carotenoids and up to thirteen. Uh, enrichment factors. And then uh, to further evaluate the potential of these methods in uh, enriching the staggerings with uh, more carotenes, so we tried uh, multi-stage extractions in which every stage uh, we will supply the 10% uh, of this staggering freshly and eventually we try to see the total uh, staggering that we got, so how much uh, uh, these carotenes has been recovered. And uh, it has proven to be quite promising at this stage. Uh, we managed to get about 88% uh, from this feedstock. So um, at the end, so we managed to prove that the LAP uh, could be used to prepare this carotene-rich precipitates, while the biodiesels uh, can be further refined in, for its original purpose. Uh, but we didn't try further on the quality of the biodiesel. I suppose the, uh, we have to do uh, more thorough studies on the, you know, the effects of ethanol removers and uh, water removers. And then uh, the recovery of the biodiesels after the processing is also not bad. Uh, we didn't lose much. Imagine that uh, the recovered uh, carotene itself is, is could be a good source of revenues. And uh, we tried to compare the antioxidant scavenging activities and found that uh, it is quite comparable to the standard the beta carotenes. Uh, this is based on the uh, LC50s, uh, the lower the better here. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, we proved that uh, the, this LAP will be possibly used to extract the carotenes uh, from this kind of waste source uh, rich in the carotenes. So uh, the utilization of the uh, electricity uh, is low and that we don't need a complicated kind of uh, equipment for the processing. Uh, these are just the key points of my, uh, our studies here. Uh, these are the references uh, used in my study. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge uh, MIPOR for sponsoring uh, the students uh, for these projects. Uh, and let the thanks all everyone uh, for your attention. Thank you. Uh, yes, my time. <laughs> thank you, Professor Edward, for this uh, very interesting talk on the clarity note. Okay, I open to the member of floor if you have any questions on the new method to extract this clarity note. Uh, I just want to know, Prof. Edward, uh, the amount of this, uh, what called the extract clarity note, is it like for how many percent is that from this uh, STO? Is it like one kg you can extract? 10% of it, how many carotene are in that particular SPO? Oh, because uh, if we use the ratio of uh, one to five, right? This means if you put in one kg that okay. you have to load in the remaining four kg of the solvents and the processing. Uh, that's where the recovery at the end, let's say three stages of the extractions, we will be able to recover about 88%. Yeah, let's so say it's one, scalable, yes. Yeah, one kg, how much character you can get? Is it? Let's say one kg of your 
point, how many gram or how many percent you can get? Is it one percent, two percent, ten percent? How many? Oh, okay. So you are referring to the total amount in the yeah, origins. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So um, because uh, these stocks, right? It actually the qual the concentration of the uh carotins in the SPO could varies. It could be go up to four hundred, but the the one that we got is about one hundred twenty ppm's. And then after three stages of the recoveries, uh, we should actually further concentrate it up to about. If you recall these things, uh, it's about, it's close to about one thousand seven hundred thirty ppm. How many percent? Is that? Very low, is it? Zero point something percent. Yeah, yeah but because the in the beginnings, the the feedstock already contains about hundred twenty ppm or sixty ppm. So we use two batches of the SPO in our study. Oh. So, uh, in the process of extractions, uh, we are more particular about how many times uh, we manage to concentrate it into the final phase, in which uh, we can have a very small amount of the steroids, yet it contains a large amount of the carotenes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Uh, question of Chan? I see your face. You want to ask? Yeah. yeah again. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the carotene will. Uh, well, it like dissolved in the uh, pumps the wind, is it? You yes, use uh, it as a carrier. Is that we use it as a carrier, and then uh, while the sterins got precipitated, so um, we will try to entrap the sterin. Oh, sorry, we will try to entrap the carotenoid because we make the flame to be very unfavorably uh, to the retention of the uh, carotenoids. That's why and, we have. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My my question is. Are you able to separate the carotene from the sterine later? We can try the solvent fractionations, uh, like what Dr. Li has done. We have we have uh, tried that, so we want to re um, extract it into the uh, olein itself. Uh, but the process right now is just the 50-50%, or so maybe I should talk to Dr. Li about how we can further enrich <laughs> this, uh, right. the things from there. Yes, it's something that we have been working uh, on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey, um, Dr. Oh, Abbott. Okay, Dr. Lee. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Abbott, um, it's very interesting work. I, I understand that you put palm stirring inside, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so do you think that other crystallizer will work just like palm stirring to like um, uh, um, precipitate mm -hmm. that carotenoids? We have not tried that. Uh, uh, do you have a specific crystallizer that you are uh, that you would like to suggest? Um, like um, DAG or many different types of stabling agents that, yeah. Mm. We we can um explore that. Uh, but I believe uh, as long as uh, the anti solvents uh that we use here will be able to promote the supersaturation states there, uh, sooner or later it can actually form. But sometimes uh we may not be able to distinguish the differences there. Uh, that's why in the beginning, we use a long like 24 hours to see whether there's a potential. A, a form of screening may be able to be conducted uh, to understand other crystallizers' potential. Yes. Maybe okay, we can talk okay. to you about like other potential collaborations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so basically, that stirring is kind of like um, um, promoting the crystallizations of that uh, oh. carotenoids. Oh no is no it? the the anti solvent the ethanol and the water, it is is used to promote the uh, precipitation of the stearin here. Oh okay. Mm, yes. All right all right. Okay. okay. Just next nice. next building only you can walk there. No, Prof Edward will be very happy sure. to talk about this. <laughs> when we go back to the campus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Uh, if not, I think uh, it's already 3.40. Uh, okay, it's uh, about tea time. And again, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Edward for this uh, wonderful talk on the anti solvents And I also like to thank the organizer and also uh, uh, Dr. Spa for, for the, as a chairman of this, uh, uh, what I call this uh, conference or symposium. So, uh, do a, I think this is already the end of our what we call program, yeah. A, do we have something? Let me see. Yes, this is unfortunately the end of the programs. Uh, thank you very much for your participations. Uh, Dr. Pusma, is, uh, is it around? You want to give some uh, 
Final words, if you are around, Dr. Puspa. So I uh, would like to thank uh, all the participants here, okay, the panelists uh, and also the attendees. Thank you very much. Uh, see you again next year. This will be a yearly event. We will we'll try to have it every year. Oh, Dr. Puspa is here. Dr. Puspa, would you like, would, would you like to say something? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much to all the chairperson, all the speakers, all the uh, attendees, uh, and whoever has stayed back until now. Yeah, thanks for the support. And um, yeah, as uh, Dr. Joanne mentioned, this is going to be an annual um, uh, symposium. So uh, I look forward to, to all of you all for next year's symposium. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, thank you again. Thanks, thanks, thanks. See you next year. Okay, uh, okay. Stay safe. Okay. Oh. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.